First on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Does anybody have anything that they want to amend or? This is the point in the meeting if there's something that's not on the agenda for the evening. Uh, this is the time to, uh, to comment or, or bring a topic up. Um, again, if, if, uh, if you do want to bring something up, just stand up and, and say your name for the record. Um, there's a lot of new faces here tonight, so say your name and, and then we'll be more than happy to go through with you. Yes, Joe. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I just think it's a crime and shame when a 69 year old senior and a 72 year old senior has to go down by Rhonda Ketna and start shoveling dirt into that culvert hole because it's about this deep, people are blowing tires. And then when I called the town manager, told him that we, like, called down here, told him that we fixed it, we threw what we could in there, was it 45 minutes that they showed up? And all the stuff is added again. Can't they put something in it that's going to stay? Okay. That's a good question, Joe. Because you did. You came in, and and then and I had said to you that Alan, I knew with Alan was off, and the guys were all set. And then Kelly called, said, Joe went up and, and put stuff in the hole where the culvert was. And then I think AJ, those guys were happened to be right on your heels. It was just a coincidence because they were already, as I told you, coming to do that. But I don't know because people are hitting it so hard. I'm not sure what's going to stay. Oh, again. Yeah. I know. And uh, you've seen it. We've had signs. It's closed. We've made sure that on Google Maps, on MapQuest, that it's closed so people are using the detour. And I don't know. I drove down there myself uh, last week. And, you know, if, because you live on it, I was up there while I saw you. You, you know, you come around, you go slow enough. But you're right. People keep hammering it. So. I, you know, what is, what can we put in there? I mean, it's going to get paid either the first week or the second week after Labor Day. Um, but I'm not sure. I, I, it for five months. I know. Six months. So, I've been going to South Burlington, Bethel, uh, Stockbridge, picking up cars because people, they're afraid to drive on there because the road is closed. Yeah. I'm trying to keep my head above water and I'm going town to town to town to town. Yeah. You know, if you want to put a sign up at the bottom that says you're open for business, Joe, that's totally no problem. But let me talk to Alan and see. I wonder if we could put some the hot patch or cold patch. We could do something in there for um, for temporary. But I'll, I'll talk to him tomorrow, Joe. Right. Thank and, and thank you for going up there, Joe. And we will have, um, a little bit later, we'll go through the FEMA project updates as well as the uh, Camp Brook isn't a FEMA project, but it's a federal highway project, so it's slightly different. But we can give you the update on that as well. Um, and it, you know, it's been kind of a longer process than we would like um, with everything that transpired um, this spring uh, on what we can do and what we have to wait to do. And um, I appreciate that everybody's been relatively patient. Um, and at times, you know, you're more than welcome to not be patient because it, it has been a burden for some time. And, and I keep hearing over in Rochester they're going to keep their section closed down until next year. So it's, it's kind of been a long process, but um, we'll, we'll go through an update on some of the projects um, and what we're doing and what we think some of these will be closing out or starting. So, uh, Any other public comment or inquiry? I'm Laura Perez, a resident of that Contractional Road. And I see on the agenda an item to discuss the bridge closures on the Union. And I'd like to request that we include it in that we can have updates on the discussion around Macintosh Hill and the whole work projects there. Yeah, so we'll we'll be going through that stuff. Um, we call it the FEMA update, but um, um, you know, we have awarded a contract to a contractor at the sitting in this room, and we'll be getting to those pieces here soon, so. Anybody else? Public comment? Okay, seeing none. 
we'll move on to the first appointment. Um, so, currently we've been in the discussion with the um, Canelo Bridge, um, which was, you know, pretty much completely destroyed during the, the spring flooding event, unfortunately. Um, and we, for, I don't know, one or two sessions now at least, we've been talking about um, our options with the bridge, um, which, you know, at first was just, you know, we're gonna get a temporary bridge and put the bridge in and, um, and then see kids to rebuild the bridge. And then we quickly found out that it wasn't, didn't quite work out the way we had envisioned it. The prices that come in far more. In some cases, the the state wants to see the bridge re-engineered, um, bigger. Um, the history on the bridge is that it's taken a lot of damage over a long period of time, so it's not the first time this has happened. So we're, we're in the process right now of just kind of exploring what are all of our options. Um, we also do have a lot of time-sensitive options. You know, we thought the temporary bridge would be the time-sensitive, you know, yeah. put it in there and then we can figure out if we rebuild, do we leave the temporary in, what do we do, and and, um, and try to get in if it's winter, because you know how it is here in Vermont, when it's winter, it in, and kind of have to wait until spring again. So, um, so our appointment this uh, evening um, for the first one, um, Dorothy, what you uh, you're more than welcome. But, you know, speaking is not your thing. You're more than welcome to sit and talk. I would just say just try to be as loud as you can so that we can hear you, and we'll try it in return. Okay. Um, I'm Dorothy Pinello, and um, I'm here because we have a bridge in Gilead. Um, the issue that we have is um, not so much that we have a bridge in Gilead. The problem is that. Um, there was a flash flood on April 15, um, and the, we understand, and we really tried very hard to be citizens of Bethel and of Gilead Brook. And in doing that, when it happened, I mean, my father died in May of last year, my mother died in June of this year. No, nobody was technically living in the house at the time. We were well aware that people like the Delegados, you know, are living here and needed to get over the bridge. So what the family said is, we're gonna leave the town alone, they'll do the right thing. Well, a month later, nobody had touched the bridge. Nobody had done anything to repair any of the bridge. Now, part of me was like, well, that's okay, but actually it isn't, because FEMA gives money to the town, and yes, the town must pay 12% of it, but for the first chunk of money there, you're allowed to, and we do up to 70 hours of kind of remediation work quick and right off the bat, like you did with Delegados, like you did with the Mitchell Road Bridge. But you didn't do that for the Pinello Bridge. So that in and of itself has created part of the issue that we have, because that work wasn't done then. We don't get that work, we no longer can get that work done. So now what we need to do is manage that issue. So from what we can tell, and in talking to the Vermont Department of Transportation, and from talking to um, the environmental, the natural resources group, what they're saying is they're willing to pay to have a temporary bridge, it's called a maybe bridge, but maybe a lot of people know of it as a, as a Bailey bridge. You put in a Bailey bridge, the bridge that's at the house now is like 60 to 65 feet, and they would do 100 feet because they said the way you do that is you take the amount washed out and add some and put it in. It's my understanding as of this afternoon, they have already said they would pay for the Bailey Bridge, they would pay for everything that needs to be done except for 12 and percent. And when I talked to Chris Bump, who's uh, your liaison with the Vermont Department of Transportation, he thought that the bid should have come in around 100,000. It came in at 330 because it was the middle of bridge building season. My father would want me to know that. And I mean, 
it was put out to bid on July 15th and needed to be done August 16th. It is a pretty quick job, but they've already got their cranes everywhere else, so they couldn't do it. Right. So the family would like to ask that before we do any more um, major decisions and big decisions for the town and for the valley, that you slow down, put it out for bid to just put in a temporary bridge. That would cost the town something in the range of $12,000. No. And why is that? Because, well, the original bid was exactly as you're saying, which we put out the bid and it came in at $331,000 because we were told by the state, which is that we put in the 100 foot maybe bridge, we rent it for 100 bucks a month, just like you and I talked about, but what, um, and they did the engineering, which was nice. For they, and they're going to oversee the installation of the temporary. But they also wanted us to take out the um, pier close to, as you say, to the mailbox, yeah. and to take out the deck itself. So um, I, we had expected that. I think this is what Chris Bumbit told you. Maybe more like one hundred and twenty-five thousand, not three hundred and thirty-one thousand. So I think it's going to cost more than twelve thousand dollars to get someone to install to to remove the deck remove the pier closest to the mailbox and they still have to put in either blocks or forms or something inside so no I, what he said today would be seventy thousand for the bridge and thirty thousand for the road work. okay i thought you said twelve thousand or yeah like, that's the town's amount oh the town's share okay, which is twelve yeah. percent if we can get the yeah absolutely if we can get the bid in it yeah Okay, so that's what we were referring to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then actually, when I talked to um, Jaron Board and and when I talked to Chris Paul, they yeah. both said the there's concrete in the brook right now. Yeah, and I that's saw called that. that's called a weir, and it's there to prevent scouring. But they put it on the downstream side and not the upstream side too. Yeah. So the even the guy I talked to with at Natural Resources said. Yeah, I guess they probably should have done it above. So he was talking today that okay. you could take the decking, which is a rather large item right now, yeah. and drop that in the brook, and you don't have to pour concrete anymore. He, You've now got it. Oh, he so would let us you, do that. you take oh. that deck, yeah. and you take the abutment and stand it up over here so it's on the wall. Yeah. So that when, as we all know, when the brook comes down, it goes this way. Yeah. If you have that there, I mean, this is all just part of like trying it's, to make it work kind right. of thing. It's interesting because he has never said that we could put the deck in the river as to scour the up. He didn't he didn't say that when he was when there. he and I were so talking, he said he said one of the problems is that he can't find and I can't find and I've been looking pretty hard to find any um, work that was done when the bridge was put in in two thousand two to see what they had done as a as a research for the 100-year flood yeah. aspect. I know, I can't find that either. And now they're it. saying you can't use that, by the way, too. Anything after Irene or soon after Irene is kind of a line, basically, because it was a 100-year flood. They're saying you have to do a new study. But all of that will be covered if you go the way they're suggesting. Which the is idea, what we put out to bid. Yeah, yeah, but the idea that you that now the, the route that you've been going down now is well, what if we repair the current bridge? FEMA's not going to pay you for that because they don't right. approve of that. Right. So the town is going to put themselves on a very large hook if they go down that route and quote fix the old bridge because right. that's not an approved FEMA method. And you don't find out about that until two years down, three years down the road, when you get their final analysis and they ensure that you've gone by all the codes and standards and what you've yeah. approved. Yeah. No, it's more for to try to make it the temporary, at least to get get you access to the property. But the town can't afford to pay. Even, you know, I mean, I, the town can't afford to pay a hundred thousand dollars for that solution and no, not get reimbursed. So exactly. I would think you wouldn't want to go down that route. No, probably not. Do you know how many times has the bridge been replaced just in your, you were telling me a story about it Christine. Been, it hasn't been replaced. When Christine In, in 2002, they put in a new bridge. Gary, why did we put in a new bridge? Because the I-beams were gone, right? So the I-beams were gone, you know, and this is a number of times Pinello Engineering had replaced the I-beams and the town, the town supplied the lumber and the family put the IVs in and put the lumber in. 
Um, so the bridge never really went out. Oh, I wasn't sure, because I know you're telling a story about Now, in 2011, Mom and Dad were on the other side of the bridge for a week. It didn't go out, though. It didn't go out. It washed out. Oh. And it took a week to get the backfill back. And that was the only time. So a couple of things I just wanted to catch up with a little bit is, so initially the reason why we went to bid in the time frames that we we did was because that the family wanted to see something in place by the end of August, from what I remember. Well, I think the family said we that need to make a, sure we had something. Right. So that's why we winter, went. And what we said was winter can be a, a moving target, shall we say. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you can't do certain work yeah. after. And then when the bids so. came in, the government didn't want to participate in the price of the bids that came in. I, yeah, I mean, so, I think all of us agree. So this wasn't a necessarily a kind of Bethel thing. This was a state and federal government are famous for telling you one thing and mean that means something else and doing another thing. But uh, so it wasn't the case of, you know, the bids came in three times more and, and we said we don't want to do it. It was they said it's too expensive and we're No, I mean it was yeah, so, it was a, it was we all agreed. Yeah, yeah, it was it was so a big number. Right now, I mean what we're doing is we obviously we want to figure out a solution. You know, not just for, for your issue but for a lot of issues of, mm -hmm. of why do you know obviously these events that we keep having. Um, and so there's there's a lot of options to explore, you know, from what you were talking about your options, there's other options. Um, so I think that's kind of where we're at right now is not necessarily, I don't think anybody's made up their mind what we're gonna do, it's just putting all the options out there. I mean, tonight wasn't the night to say we're gonna, you know, blow that, you know, throw up that road and be done with it. I mean, it was just, we're trying to figure out what is best for the town at this point. Um, and there were studies that were done after Irene and, uh, Coincidentally, it happened to get a publication that, that finished it from Lake Champlain and they sent it out. I don't recall them copy. Maybe everybody got a copy, but. So they came up with different um, uh, steps of, you know, after flooding, what, you know, how you rebuild and what should you look for. And, you know, one thing that is, you know, and, it, and we wouldn't be doing our job with the town of Bethel if we didn't explore all of our options. You know, if we just rushed into one option, that just wouldn't be fair to so, um, so one option that has come up is, and this kind of goes along with last year, you know, there was the river corridor, you know, um, that came down from the state of Vermont saying basically like, well, if the river keeps washing out cer certain sections, should we really be rebuilding in those sections again, you know? Um, so that's kind of where this kind of came into it was, you know, consider whether, you know, whether we really need to rebuild anything at all. and. But then that kind of opens up another thing of, you know, if, if we decided not to build anything that went to your property, how many other properties are like your property? So that's kind of, you know, so we did some. I think there's three. So we did some, you know, looking around in the town to see how many other single use properties we have that the town owns a bridge to. Um, so that's kind of the process. That's about as far as we've gotten in this process to date. Right, and, you, and all the statue. And then Dorothy, you know, we've been talking, which is great. She's been really helpful with the history and trying to figure it out. So it looks like there's Jeff's Bridge, which is, is that what they call Mitchell Bridge to your camp? So Mitchell Bridge, Delgado, Pinello seem to be the, their bridges to one home. And that was what the select board asked was because what Chris is saying is that obviously one of the options for the select board is to throw up the road so that way the taxpayers in Bethel aren't on hook on the hook for the ERAF, which is the twelve and a half percent of whatever the cost is to rebuild, you know, um, the bridge or uh, whether it's Jeff's or Delgado's or uh, you know, or Christine and Dorothy's, or so. And we were also trying to, Dorothy and I have been talking, also trying to work with the state, is there a way to, because the process for them is a temporary bridge, engineering, and a permanent bridge, is there a way, we also kind of looked at trying to engineer the permanent bridge, so instead of putting a temporary and then a permanent, we just did like a one-shot deal and got 
the engineered permanent bridge in place to avoid the step of the cost of installing the first, the temporary bridge, but that's not going to work either. <laughs> so, but we have been talking to, and, and Dorothy's been great help talking to B-Trans and Jaren, and we're, we're trying to find the best solution. So, so I guess my concern is, and, and I think people of Gilead and people of Bethel need to be concerned that if the Board of Selectmen considers, well, we'll just throw up those roads, well, maybe now we're sort of going to throw up the roads where there's two houses. You know, I mean, okay, how many bridges are affected then? And that just doesn't seem like the right way for a community to run and deal with it. It just that, that doesn't seem right. I mean, it's down, we, we could also save money by not putting salt on the road. This right. I mean, you know, it's just, it doesn't seem to make the right kind of community sense. And I respect that as a board, you know, you're a volunteer board and you're doing, you're here to try and do the job and it, it can be just to look at and all I, the different variables. I mean, there's so many different variables. You want to do what's right for you, you know, in your case, but it also reflects on other properties too. So there's a lot of different pieces, moving pieces and parts. So we're not saying that definitely doing anything right now, we're just investigating the possibilities. And unfortunately, it's taken a certain amount of time. Um, and you, you look at that bridge every day, you know, you know it's there every day. It's, it's, we're trying to do the best we can to gather the information and make an intelligent decision. But I guess, to me, putting in a 100-foot maybe bridge that Jaron Borg said, I've already approved it. I've already said I would do it. You don't have to do a hydraulic study. All you need to do is drop in. Mm -hmm. And Chris Baum from, from the Vermont Department of Transportation said he figured it would probably come in at 100000 Yes, but we have to put it out to bid. But it seems like that's a pretty straightforward, get it done solution. And for us, we had a ton of people come to the pre-bid meeting, and so we thought we were golden. So if you do it again in October? Yeah, yeah October, well, we might, mm -hmm. and, and, and do it again, or put it out sooner, if that's what the board wants me to do. I will definitely put it out sooner, and um, or put it out right away, doing the same. We have the process done. I have the RFP. I have everything. And um, so, yeah, it was surprising that, that when we saw, and then since then, they've agreed to drop that price by 75000 but that's still too high. So if that's what the board wants, I can put that thing out to bid tomorrow again. Um, because you're right, and we already have Hobie Gates from the state. He's already set to oversee the installation. He's, so we're, you know, we, for a bit, we could, if that's what the board wants, I could put it back out tomorrow. You know, again, and I don't think anybody has made up their mind, but, you know, we just have to thoroughly go through the logic behind, you know, it may only be 12000 or maybe $25,000 short term for us to fix access to that bridge. But, you know, we're talking about a bridge, and it's not just your property, but, you know, if you have a bridge that's a 50-foot span bridge or 60-foot span bridge, it's now going to be 100, and you see all the erosion that's going on in that stream bed. You know, what's to say that springtime that, that happens again and now it has to be a 120 foot bridge or a 140 foot bridge? Well, then you're going to have to move Gilly. You know, where does it go? And, so. But that, that's kind of the thinking behind some of these, you know, and, and again, this is the state that, you know, puts out these that, you know, that encourages communities that sometimes there, there are times where you don't rebuild the road, where you don't rebuild the bridge, or you don't, you know, do it because the stream is just going to consume it again. So. Not saying that that's what we decided to do, but it's just it's just one of many options, like Paul was saying, that right now we're just kind of thinking through. Um, because, you know, it is easier to swallow, obviously, if there was 10 people that lived on the road, right? Because if you spend $25,000, it's divided amongst 10 people. Rather than $25,000, that's divided amongst one person uh, with one access, right? And it, it's just... It's tough. So. Well, I think I think you can look at it that way. Please, everyone, I'm not doing this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's 54 acres. That could, in 10 years, in 20 years, be, you know, 14 people. 
contributing to the tax base of Hopkinton. But, of uh, Bethel, I'm sorry, my whole thing. Um, you know, you, it just seems you need to think through the whole thing. I guess that's all. And the more people that look into this, the more information you've got. I mean, look at how much information she got. My name is Lisa Delgado, and I just want to say that the Delgado for youth has always stood. It's just this, the turn on either side of it that goes. So I feel like if we could figure out any kind of way to have the water have a channel to go through, maybe <coughs> we could fix that solution. Uh, when I first bought, when we first moved there in '92. I had to drive a riding lawnmower up and back five times beside the, you know, the, the, the road that goes along the bridge. And now my dog can't run beside the car. I mean, literally, there's a So when we bought it, you know, we just, we bought it thinking that it was a town road. And otherwise, we wouldn't have purchased it. So I'm just hoping that if that was ever going to happen, I would have been warned by more people than just Dorothy. <laughs> That yeah. this was even being discussed so that we could give input or I could help find solutions because I'm kind of like her. I look at it as, as a, a game that needs to be solved or won, you know, one way or another. Yeah, yeah, um, Carl Russell. So I'm, I think that I want to clarify a few things. Um, number one, it's not a bridge to a residence, it's a town road to a residence, yep. and that's what I think needs to be evaluated. Clearly, you're looking at the bridge, but you have to address the issue of town roads and private, and private residences, and Dorothy's point about where it goes and what's on the other side and what the value of having a town road in an area is a big issue, and you know that we've talked about that before in this town. Why, why maintain, and of course, several of these are actually third-class roads not fourth class one. So you're getting tax money for, for that as well. Um, the other issue is that it's not erosion under the Pinello Bridge. This is the way that the entire village brook is managed. That the scour that Dorothy referred to was not from upstream. It was actually from downstream, from over harvested material post Irene. And I got actually photographs from two years ago of that abutment, of that below their bridge, the, the scour plate, fully exposed on the downhill side. And that, I'm, I wasn't there when it washed, but I can almost guarantee that it didn't, that the water removed the soil from underneath that plate and it tipped. And that's why it washed out the way it did right now. So you can't necessarily, I mean, I'm just throwing one more thing into the many that you're considering, but the bottom line is, it's not that bridge, and it's not the issues at that bridge. It's the rip wrapping upstream from that. It's the efforts to keep the stream under the Delgado Bridge. It's the efforts to keep the stream under the Sawyer Bridge up on the Gilead Brook Road. Um, this is a big issue, and it's not going to go away just because you decide you're going to fund or not fund that particular bridge. So, um, I mean, it's not a bigger than you're going to solve right here, but I think if you're going to talk about many issues, I think it's important that you put it into the context. And within that context, fixing the bridge so that the family can get access to their property seems to make logical sense. Thanks, Carol. Yep. Um, I'm Carol Young, and um, I heard you speak that you were thinking about the long-term considerations. And it does seem to me as if um, these three properties, and probably more, if you continue this consideration, um, the tax value will drop considerably. And I'm not sure that Bethel can afford to lose those taxes or the access and therefore maintenance to those properties that are beyond the bridge. Okay, thank you. Yes, Chris. Chris Flores from Gilliesburg Road. Um, I, I don't think throwing up roads, whether they're class three or four, is generally a good idea. The only thing we can say with some certainty about land is that its value is going to increase most likely uh, over time as uh, 
Dorothy said, there's likely to be more residents, more taxpayers, and this would cause a drastic reduction in value of people's property. And there's, each one of these roads are, are different. There's some specifics that need to be considered. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with is the right of way that crosses our property is the Goodale Road Bridge that goes to the Delgados residence. Um, in that case, if the town were to just abandon the right of way, the Delgados would have no frontage on any public road. They would have no legal access to their residence at all. It would just be gone in the town to, to throw that up. So that's a pretty important consideration. Now, certainly, neighbors would work together to form a solution, but it would be very time consuming, very costly. It would really put them in a pickle. And I, you know, I think all these nuances of, of the law and the situations. In this particular case, Goodale Road passes through other private land before it gets to the property. And it's similar, too, with, uh, with the road that passes by Gilman's Camp. There's other private landowners up beyond there that may want to do something Here that it's a slow process, but it needs to be a slow deliberate process in terms of fact finding. Um, but I think these, these solutions, these interim solutions, probably should be proceeded with um, for now until those more permanent decisions are made. Thank you, Chris. And I just wanted to clarify one thing. And, and again, you know, there's so many options. And, and I, I feel from being um, we're living in the town in 13 years that there was a lot of times in the past that we just made really quick, short-term rush into judgment decisions. And it, it's good to be able to kind of sit back and figure out what our options, what is the best options for, for the town? You know, do we invest in certain roads or bridges or do we not? Um, and what is in the best interest for the taxpayers of the town? Um, regardless of who's resident. So it just so happens to be, you know, Dorothy's at this point, but could be somebody else tomorrow. And, and they're all very good, valid points um, here. And, and I think, um, well, two things. One, you know, one thing that we were trying to do was to get people to come to the meeting just like this. So it's good to have that valuable um, feedback back from the public because if we make a decision to go forward with putting um, an investment into that bridge, then we, we all have to understand as a community that we're all, you know, we, we all have, you know, a small stake in this thing, right? So not just, you know, the select board makes a decision and we go spend a bunch of money and then everybody's going, well, why did our taxes go up, you know? <laughs> so it's really good that we have the community out here and, and it seems to be in a rather positive um, motion. So, it, you know, it, it, there's a lot of volume here. So, it, you know, it, the second thing too is, uh, you know, the throw it up or whatever option that they call it, you know, that wouldn't be that you wouldn't have necessarily access to your property. What that would mean is that you now have responsibility for the access to that property. So it's a little different. You, nobody would be left on an island. Well, and, and, <laughs> <laughs> is an option, which it is, um, for this piece of property, then it wouldn't be fair if we didn't say, well, how many other people are in the same circumstance, you know, so which we did some information and found that there's two others. So, um, but that meant, you know, if we did decide to do one, maybe we would do the other two, or maybe we wouldn't do any of them, you know, because you don't want to do one without doing another one or, or however that goes. So, well, I guess my problem with some of the logic that I'm hearing is that because my parents happened to die at just the wrong time, our bridge is the one we're discussing throwing up. Well, my logic, I can tell you, my logic comes from a study from the state of Vermont that I just had to get in the mail this past weekend that came from, well, it started, and Carl was on the board when this whole thing started, but it, some of this had started from the river corridor system about it just like exactly what Carl was saying. The more that we try to manage the system, the more disruptive the system can be in the, in the channel of the water. So 
we have to be careful because the more that we do arm our banks, the more disruptive that downstream can end up being. And that was kind of, we went through the bylaws there, was it two years ago, Carlos? Three? And that was, you know, the state through the whole river corridor thing in there at that time. And, um, you know, made, made, you know, like we put a lot of time into that. Um, but, um, you know, because the more that we do try to make it man-made, you know, the more impacts can happen down the road. So it was kind of just, um, just, and then out of the studies that came from Irene, um, there was, you know, different options of, you know, how should you, um, how should you reconstruct the roads? How, how can you do preventative maintenance for going forward on roads? Um, you know, how can you better protect, you know, you know, lakes and, you know, and then there's the piece that they also put in there is, is when do you consider not to do, you know, so that those are just all options that came out of that, you know. If you're constantly, not saying in your case, but if you're constantly rebuilding something, you know, at some point, does it make sense to keep rebuilding it, you know? Um, so, I, I think we, <clears throat> I like the, the, I really enjoyed the turnout and the feedback. Um, again, this was just one option and, you know, there could be 10 options on the table, and granted, most people are going to take the one that's most fearful and think that's going to happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that, um, regardless of who lives in the house. It was, it's well, an option, and... Yeah, and that was unfortunate, too. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't. I, I didn't have the pleasure of meeting your parents. I just spoke to your dad once on the phone. We had a great conversation, but none of us here made the decision not to fix the bridge at the time, so that obviously was, well, we weren't, you know, Greg made the decision at the time because Jeff was with him to try to figure out what we're going to do. And I think Delgado's they backfilled right away. I think maybe Jeff right. would know better than I did, but um, but anyways, but yeah, no. I, yeah, I, but if you had backfilled like like you did on the Mitchell Bridge and the Delgado, I don't actually, Jeff, did you do your own? Or, yeah. Okay. yeah. So Delgado. Yeah. All right. No, but I yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but Pinellas would have done that years ago. That's mm -hmm. what we used to do. Yeah. So. Delegados, you backfilled. If you had backfilled Pinellos right afterwards, yeah. the bridge wouldn't be slanted in doing what it's doing now. It's just exactly right. We, yeah. Well, but I know, but it's because my parents weren't there, so you were. Yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't make the decision. Uh, I don't know. But it, it's unfortunate. But you're the head of the highway department. Who made that decision then? The town manager at the time. Well, I won't. I won't say 100 percent on that either. I he was there. I was up on day one. I took a tour up there and looked at your bridge um, and the Delgado Bridge because actually that I think had just got to fill on it. That was one of the first things. And um, apologize. And I was up there with one of the construction engineers for the state and. And then after we had a little bit more information, they were they were very hesitant with allowing us to go into the stream to do anything with your bridge because a couple of things. At that point, they had determined that they felt that there was some structural issues with the bridge, so that if we backfilled the bridge and built in um, the approaches, that the bridge itself was not sound. Now I can't say 100% because I did not spend all my time doing it. But on the visit that I had, that was what came up because because Jeff had already backfilled the other bridge. Um, but the the state guy, I can't remember what his name that was out there, had strongly suggested that until we get somebody to come out and take a look at the bridge, that they didn't want us to put access to that bridge because they didn't know if the bridge was going to be sound. And then a short period of time later, they deemed that there was some deficiencies with that bridge, and they didn't want us to do that work. So I wouldn't. You know, it's so easy. We can blame the person that's not well, here, not or highway crew. But so it's, I can tell you that the state of Vermont had a hand in that, uh, of not necessarily wanting us to do that. So, oh, well, that I didn't um, know. I've never heard this so, information either. Um, but you know, they don't think about the other yeah. thing that what he said happened mm -hmm. times is so important. If there was people living there, we would have treated this completely yeah. different. Yeah. You know, if her parents were still alive, we wouldn't have said, well, you got to move out. There's nothing we can do for six months. 
And, and I, I completely understand where you're coming from, but you also have to understand that we were hit in multiple, multiple areas of this town. At that time, we have to prioritize first, second, third. We can't do it all at the same time. It's just like with you know the the projects that Jeff's doing and 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 the other contractors right now. I mean, there there were other there were other homes at that time that were impacted that didn't have anybody in them. And, and you're absolutely right. Had somebody been maybe physically living in the house, it would have been a higher priority. But since there wasn't. The priorities then shift to others at that time. It, so I was supposed to be living there. I just want to be 100% clear. My house didn't, just hadn't sold yet. Oh. So I guess it's lucky that I wasn't living there, or me and my two-year-old would still be stuck there, right? Because yeah. you wouldn't have fixed it, because you well, didn't make a decision. We don't have, have to get into an argument on this. We really don't. Yeah. Well, you I have to understand. I think you have to understand, too, that why people would be a little upset that you would tell them that you're not, you're just, you're considering, even considering, not granting access to a road because there were people living in here. So I understand that it would be, you know, maybe second on the list or maybe third, but you didn't even try to contact us. There was I no kind of machine initial contact. You didn't try. You, 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 you know, know that since since day one, since day one after the flood, that bridge was looked at and the process had started. So this wasn't, you know, for But is it saying that a decision wouldn't have made it made more swiftly should I have been living there? It's just a ridiculous but well, what I'm saying is, okay, I'll back up. Even if you were living there, on day one, on day one, the process did start. Did start. The process did start. I was out there day one. Boots on the ground. I was out there day one. The thing is, there was no viable options on day one to that house. Okay, so we're going to, no, that's a little bit of a So we are going to somewhat throw rocks, blame, whatever you want to call it. The former town manager, I can only use the words, did not honestly represent himself because he told me it was going out for bid the Monday after he left. And when I called Therese, <laughs> yeah, no, he told me to call Friday to find out what the bid, what the documents looked like. Therese said, yeah, yeah, we've never even met with the state. So that's one of the problems. So one of the problems is that I was trying, as the family did not all call you, did they? We did one representative because we were trying not to be hard. So one representative was contacting you and I didn't get the truth. Well, I would have pushed it harder. And it's unfortunate. And it would have happened to you. Yeah. So I think we're done discussing it for now. But I do think it's very important that the town be direct with everyone in Gilead Brook that if you're making a plan and you're thinking about something, you need to be sure we all know that. And, you know, there, there are abutters to the lands. There's all of us who need to be made aware of what the town is thinking. And, and, and I, I unfortunately that. don't physically live in town now. But I feel I should be told. I can tell you that the 100% the direction in which this board was was and probably still is leaning is to put a temporary bridge there. Okay? Thank the you. only thing that stood in our way is the government who you're talking to that says everything's good. They're the ones that said we're not going to participate because it's too expensive. No. It came out Gary of work said he well, would not recently say they've yet. changed their mind. Yes, recently. Now we gotta go through the process again. But up up until this whole thing, the reason why it took so long to get it out of bid is because the state had to weigh in on it. They had to bring in all the river engineers and everybody else. It takes lots of time. And then when we finally went to bid, the bid came in three times higher. And then they said, well, wait a minute. We're not this big. So maybe so that would have been the, we would have had to come up with $300,000, <laughs> yeah, which that makes any sense. sense yeah. So that's where we're at right now. So maybe what we could do is tomorrow I could put it all back out to bid. The select board has the right to not accept any of the bids. But at least if I put it out to bid tomorrow, when we have all the documentation, we could put it all back out to bid tomorrow and see what realistic, you know, prices like Dorothy was saying would come in at with a longer construction time. So obviously, yeah, Dorothy had luck was right on, and she had filled the fuel tank in like March or April. Like Actually, right I need to check on that. Yeah, before, so she thought that she had. But it was the longer than that. It was because I paid for it. <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong. Just a detail in the family. <laughs> you know, this has been a great discussion. I mean, this is, Absolutely. Uh, you know, let me just say there's probably, 
you know, 40 more people here tonight than are usually here. So, um, and it's really nice to see the feedback come from the community on making these decisions because it's good for a community to make these decisions rather than just four people or five people on the board of people. You know, because it shows that there is buy-in from the community. We want to do this. This is what we'd like to do. And I know, you know, what I try to do on this board is I don't come into this with my own agenda. You know, this is what I want. I, I usually listen to people, what, what is it that the community wants? And then that's what we try to, to answer with, with the community. So I think it's good. Yeah. With, the, with the newer information that we have just recently gotten from the state, there's, there's no harm, I don't think, in going out to bid on a, a temporary bridge that may end up being a permanent bridge or whatever that ends up Do being. You, but you need to be, you need to say something about that make it a permanent bridge. Yeah, no, that doesn't yeah. flow with, with, with No, with the state. You can only use a temporary bridge for 24 months now. So. Yeah. Well, that's and state of Vermont's got some bridges out there that have been in well, there for 20 yeah. years as temporary. Well, I just, I, I, no, this is me. No, I'm sure you're right. Bevel. I don't want you to get stuck with the full cost because you didn't abide by the cookies. Yeah, I'll double check so with you tomorrow. Well. So what do you think is a reasonable like stretch for me to put the bid if we put it back out well, but see, for any for... construction tape? It's right, like wait, October. Well, but I think to ask, I'd like it tomorrow morning. So I know, I know. Me. No, no, what I'm saying is I think we need to make it realistic to get a decent bid yeah. and have us get in there before snow flies and not the two weeks after snow flies. Yeah, and exactly. When does snow fall? So we'll season, ask, maybe? So how long does it take to put that bridge in? Do you have an estimate from actually, the press or something? Yeah, he said that he thought the whole thing could actually be in in less than, a, he thought the bridge itself could be in in less than a week because it depends, and I think Jeff could probably chime in on this, he was at the pre-bid because they're saying you could either pour piers or you could use blocks to put it in. and. I mean, I think that the state, after speaking to Hobie Gates, who you saw too, I think, Jeff, and um, Chris, is they were thinking the whole thing, maybe not the approaches, but the, definitely the bridge itself over the piers was, should be a thought, you know, should be in in, in in a week. Now, I'm not sure if that's the approaches or doing the drive after, but Still certainly the bridge there. itself. So he seemed to think they could be in and out in two well, weeks. Which is or why less. it's not as expensive, because. Yeah, he seemed to think in and out in two weeks was his thing. So then we should put it back out to bid tomorrow. We have everything and put a longer date on. And I'll talk to FEMA, the FEMA rep. She's coming back on Thursday too, to, because that's really good information about clarifying the time frame on the on the temporary bridge. So I made a note. I'll ask her. That's Jessica. the notes that I gave you this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. So I'll double check with Jessica. She's coming back on Thursday, and I'll let you know. Um, but so let put it out to bid and see what we get. Who? Um, I would have to look at the map to see if there was any work to be done. We had two phases. Either some was contract work and some the road crew is going to do. But I would have to look at the map, Lisa. It has a, does it have a stake? Yes, stake. Yeah, then it is probably part of the bid package. And yes, it's already been awarded, actually. So it'll be. You know, um, I think the end date on that is maybe the middle of September. Uh, I think middle of September, 9:15 until the, I think is the finish on that. So, so yeah, that was if it's the state, then yeah. Anything outside the state, the road crew will do. Hi, thank you for coming in today. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. All the information. This is. Uh, well, there will be an update on this on the next one. Yes. We probably we won't have the bids back yet, but um, it'll be the meeting the after. Would be well, it'll. I think my guess is the board will wait now until they see what the bid price, what the bid is. I guess I'm not sure. What yeah. is your what do you do? Yeah, I mean, again, it's not always just so easy for us to make decisions. Either this, the state has to weigh in as well. So. Once well, once the state has weighed in now, yeah. and now people have to bid. Is it two weeks we have to wait for the bid? Um, I'll, we'll, yeah, we'll probably give them a couple of weeks. Probably if I post it tomorrow, we usually try to give contractors a good, you know, 10 to 12 days to kind of before they can put it back. But they should be pros at it because if they same ones come, they've already seen all the documents. But that's yes, probably two weeks. But I'll keep in. I'll, I'll email you tomorrow and tell you what the dates are. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming.
Anything further on the discussion? Anybody yeah. have had a chance to speak? So this is well, my name is Tony Delacroix. I've got a little bit of a video on the road. But anyways, uh, I just want to say the water bubble, the trees bubble, the road bubble, the bridge is up. Like you wouldn't believe after a flood, it just packs and south. And the water has no place to go but around. So I just want to bring it up to everybody. I didn't hear anything about trees removal. I didn't hear anything about that kind of stuff. But I've been there, I've lived it, I've seen it. And I know what causes the whole problem. It's the trees that plug up the bridge. And then from there, you know, just wash the ground. And then when you hear the big rock smashing in the middle of the night, you know you've washed the bridge. Are these trees you're talking about, are they, um, are they in, in the brook itself, or are they on no, the sides? They're probably drunk down from, you know, from the there. It's the landslides that are coming in. A large chunk will come in, and then they all get the bridge. Well, I was just trying to figure out where the trees are at, because if they're if the trees are on the banks or up against the structure, then we have the right to remove those. Right. But if the trees in the brook, they're not, we're not allowed to go in the brook. They want us to go in the brook between. Because I think Dorothy made a good observation about actually Jeff's bridge. She said when she looked down, there's a bunch of trees and stuff in the water. She said we get another storm and she thinks Jeff's bridge is going out. But because she said she'd seen a bunch of trees in the water. and. And now that you have some good contacts with the state, Dorothy, you should bring up <laughs> about the tree removal in the brook. Yeah, that's right. Because you, you're, everybody here is absolutely right. Because all the debris that's in there, it's not just trees, it's, it's uh, stone, silt that piles up, and, and it just sits in there. And then the next storm, it floats down, plugs up the next culvert, blows out the next bridge, right? But the, that's a perfect example of they won't let us go into or contract or go into the brook. You know, after I mean they didn't like what was done with Gilead Brook. So they actually paid the local contractor to go all the way back up the brook, brook putting fish structure back in. And Jeff, where would you say that fish structure is now? <laughs> I mean that it was such a waste of money. Yeah. And, and it's the state that we're talking about again, not not us. But we're talking about twelve thousand dollars on our part. Oh yeah, you know that's amazing. Yeah. And they won't give us permits to put riprap in until we did it. Mm -hmm. I just remind, want to remind everybody where we live. Okay, we live in Yeah, I'm I'm Thatcher, and I also live up on Gilead Brook Road. Um, and those of us with uh, property on the other side or right of way across those bridges, it would be great. I don't even know if it's legal or legally required, but for us to be notified of any kind of process in this decision making, it's kind of odd that we're all kind of here based on one or two people really getting fired up about this and, get, and doing a lot of organization. But it seems like the town should be the responsible thing and contact us to let us know that these are issues that are coming down the pipeline. We would have been if they had decided right. that they were going to make, there's a very specific and long state process for it. So if that was going to happen, um, for sure, that is exactly what would have happened. In fact, there's a whole process for it to be notified. The agendas are on the Facebook page, the website. Um, we publish them every week before, you know, every Friday before, you know, a meeting, so anyone can look at them. But absolutely, if they were going to do something for certain, um, there's a very process in which, yes, you certainly, absolutely, positively would have been notified. And you do an on-site meeting and the whole thing. So I can't, I can't, imagine, I can't imagine being notified and being told, like, oh, we made a decision. This is what's going to happen. Yeah. I guess what I'm asking is, can we be more included in this process, going into any options and decisions? It seems like this should be the last resort. So, and my second question was just, I don't know if the psych board understands, like, and I don't understand, but what happens to the taxpayers whose property are impacted by this? If a decision like this goes down, is there compensation for people who own the property that are impacted? I think what you what would see is is just what um, someone had said earlier is that you know the value of the property the listers would it would affect the grant list because the value of the property without the access would right. drop so the taxes would drop so yeah. you're right it's a I'm talking, I'm talking about the individual uh, people who own the properties compensation no there would be no compensation just the unfortunately the value that of the seems, property would drop but I, I think 
again, again, a few of you in the audience are getting way ahead here, way ahead. The last thing we want to do is, is disturb uh, residents or shut something down with. Again, it's all about the grand list. The grand, if we decide not to put a bridge on, the grand list goes down. We lose a property or two or three or four or five or however it is. You know, so it's a, it's a double negative, right? Because you you lose one person's tax money, but you also the grand list goes down. So I mean, we're we're exploring options. We're not we're not here saying we're closing roads. We're exploring options. I think it got a little little carried away a little bit tonight on on that, but it's just one, well, I, I can tell you, it's just one of many options that we're looking at. And there's been some recent information from the state that has changed some of those things. So, um, and believe it or not, it was the state that said, hey, how about throwing it up? <laughs> so, I mean, that came from the state. And so, you know, I mean, it's, it's just an option. It's not something that carried out every weight. So. Yeah, I find, you know, I find it offensive when you say that you think people got a little carried away. When you stand up front and wave your brochure from the state and say, I read this girl and I know what I think I should, you know, not definitely what you should do, but what an option is. I find that offensive and to say that we're overreacting, I, I think that's underestimating the situation.
we've uh, we've done probably well, more than half the work on that contract. Uh, those are some of the roads that encompass in 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 the area of Louisville, um, and, and that's all been being done by the same contractor. And, and I would think you're, within the week you probably have those ones finished up too. So we're we're moving right along pretty good. And um, you know these were contracts that we had completion dates up there for the end of August, and it seems like they're they're uh, getting done uh, faster than anticipated. Um, the east quadrant, which is which is um, the Christian Hill, um, Sanders, Arnold, um, North Main Street, Finley Bridge area, uh, that contract um, started uh, last Wednesday. So currently we're on um, on the. Um, um, that must have a middle of September. Christian, yeah, Hill. That, that, yeah, that one's got a middle of September completion date. Um, I would say the contractor keeps going in the direction they're at, but that should be done, you know, well before then. And and the most recent one that um, was awarded was the Northwest Quadrant, uh, which that's the Gilead area. Um, I apologize, I don't have all the uh, the roads with me exactly that they affect. Um, but that one we'll be looking at starting some work there probably within the next week, week and a half. Um, so I'll, I've been. And that goes to the also the middle of September? Yeah, contracts through the middle of September. So yeah. I'll be out there. I've been uh, heading up um, all the dirt well, all the gravel jobs so far, so just kind of getting out in front of them. Um, some of the challenges that we have had is, you know, this this damage occurred back in the spring, and we've had, you know, one or two or three other smaller events since then, so there's been, in some cases, extra erosion in those areas. Um, in some cases, we may be doing work on one road that was bid out with FEMA, and now there's that same road down down farther is it's got erosion going on now that's not a FEMA project and and won't be a FEMA project so now those are being identified and we're starting to work with the road crew um, like for instance we had um, Jeff's firm uh, you know fin finishing up Lilliesville and Whittier and as we've been doing the uh, Lilliesville and Whittier um, I've been getting with Alan, and Alan has been coming out there to do some punch list items that weren't covered under the bid um, that we've been doing in-house through the town. And for any of you that uh, live, I don't think many of you live in that area, but any of it that lives in the Louisville or Whittier has noticed here in the last two weeks that we've done um, substantial work there. Um, that's that's kind of how this is going to flow as we go, is um, I'm working with Alan, so as the contractors are doing work in certain areas, I'm contacting um, Alan and Therese to give them, hey, this is what else I see out there that we need to address. Um, and then we've been putting that on the list of kind of try to button that up as the contractors go. We're going to come behind them and, and get the areas that weren't covered. Um, the Canbrook paving um, piece, which um, we just barely awarded that contract, the completion date for that is October 12th. Um, the contractor has said that they start the work after Labor Day. And it'll take about a week to do. So um, I'm willing to say that that work will get done probably pretty close to a month ahead of schedule from what was advertised. Um, that one's been a, a really slow moving project just because there's um, the, the gravel road ones that I mentioned first, those are done through FEMA. Um, the Canberra Road is being done all with federal highway money because um, Canberra Road is a corridor road from here to Rochester. So um, years ago, it used to be under state control, and I don't know, at some point, when it was that it got turned over to the town to maintenance, but federal highway still has a hand in that. Um, so that will be done through federal highway money, which is actually better for our community because they will pay 100% of it. Um, so we won't be stuck at the end with a 12.5% ERAP on that. So um, 
However, with that comes a little bit slower process. So, uh, so the state actually went out there and identified what needed to be done. Some work has been done um, through, uh, through another contractor or contractors during the emergency period. Um, and then the, right now the rest, the in-road work will be done un under the contractor that just talked about. And then we're also talking with the state right now with some other work on that road that needs to be done, like in, um, some rip wrapping in around the culverts, some extra ditching, um, stone lining, some other ditches up through there um, that we're trying to get them to participate in. Um, again, that will be once we have the contractor going there in September, again, if there's anything that isn't picked up by the state at that time, we'll be getting together with Alan and the road crew to kind of do some punch list items on, on getting some of that caught up. Um, and, then, and then obviously we have the bridge is, is one that um, we thought we had all figured out early on until some wrenches were thrown into it, but hopefully this will come around. Um, and then the peep, and then we'll have one more contract that, that, or two more, that we haven't really, we're in the process of putting together, it's really kind of a catch-all for uh, some smaller one. Or, I had a break you know, in the separate, so the water sewer is out a bit, but P-Vine is, now we need to get an engineer for P-Vine as well, because the, there's a massive culvert part way up the road, and then there's an erosion, they call it a slide, but where if you look, like half right here drops down, and then it's all missing to the river. So we have to get an engineer for that. So, um, so we're hoping to get one. You know, maybe we can do one engineer now and get the engineer for Peavine culvert, Peavine slide, and maybe Pinello too to try to get every, you know, um, do all the projects in Bethel at once. So that's um, that's actually going to go out to bid hopefully this week. I'm waiting for the RFP to come from Two Rivers for that one. So. Yes. Yeah. I'm very friends. I live on Macintosh Hill, and. Uh, you know, we talked a little about the erosion that's occurred since uh, earlier storms. Our, our road is getting to the point of almost being unpassable and the ditch is all of a sudden like, collapsing uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and so I'm wondering, I also heard that there was talk of narrowing the road and bringing the ditches further in. So I'm wondering if you can uh, respond to those. So we, uh, I, I know where that's coming from, but um, I mean, the idea right now is to is to make sure that our ditches are correct so that they can handle the amount of water that um, during a, a large event. Um, now I'll say to date, there's only been one road that we've done under a contract that has slightly, um, which isn't finished yet, that has been slightly narrowed because of the volume of water that went through, which was Campbell Road. Um, it was a huge volume of water that went through Campbell Road. And if you can see how it comes off the mountain, the next event that we have, it will be just like that. Um, so our ditch channel was deeper and was wider than normal. What's happened over time in our town is we've gotten used to seeing these nice wide roads with no ditch lines or little ditch lines or greater ditch line, right? And, and greater ditch lines and small ditch lines are fine for most normal roads, except for some of these roads that we are identifying that can that can or do have large water that hits them during an event. Um, so we're trying to be proactive with that. At the same time, through the FEMA uh, work, there are certain um, specifications that we're working with. So um, you know, five or six foot ditch lines rather than you know a two foot ditch line. Um, and 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 Campbell's and Campbell Road. The road overall has been narrowed right to date. Um, but looking at the width of that road and comparing it to other roads that I've seen out there is not really any different than the other roads we have. So I can't really comment on McIntosh Hill because I, I physically haven't been there to start staking it out to see what we got going on there. Um, but the idea is to put in a, a, uh, a ditch line that can uh, absorb the water penetration that we get during the event uh, and to maximize our road width. Um, uh, but I can't tell you any more information because I really haven't been there to do any of the surveying yet. What about the 
I'm sure Alan's writing that down. He'll, you know, have someone go up there and take a look at that and see what we can do for maintenance while we're waiting. Um, I thought that the road from the middle of the road, 25 feet either way, was like almost like eminent domain. So I understand the need to make wider ditches. That makes so much sense. But I don't understand why they're going into the road instead of out into the land. Well, in some cases, in some cases, you know, Jeff can attest to it. In some cases, you're right up against a bank, right? So you, you can't go into the bank, or if you do go into the bank, the bank's just going to slough them back into the ditch line. So you kind of have to go to the towed bank and then extend your ditch line out, which comes into the roadway. Um, but we had, you know, a lot of our dirt roads. And a lot of dirt roads in the state of Vermont are built on 18-foot dirt roads. So we've kind of, that's the way a lot of dirt roads were built. And over time with, you know, decades of grading, some of those roads now that were 18 are now 20, 22 feet wide. Um, so we got kind of used to riding on these wider roads. Um, but at the same time, our ditch lines became very small. And when we have, I don't know how many inches of water fell does anybody know how many inches of water fell in that storm that we had in the spring? But, you know, if you get four or five inches of rain that falls, you know, it's gone. Um, I think that's fair, but I think it also needs to be maintained as a two-lane road. Right. Oh, absolutely, yeah. The intent is to be a two-lane road. Right. Yep. Would you say that Campbell Road is a two-lane road? Well, Campbell Road is not finished yet, so I guess I'm... Right. I've gone out to measure on the weekends, and there's spots that's 12 feet yeah. wide. No, no, I'd measure the whole road. Just okay. The narrowest on Campbell Road currently is 15 feet wide. <laughs> I live on Campbell, and uh, initially there was, we were pretty concerned about how narrow it was going to be. But after they added the enormous stone, like it's going to be a uh, two vehicle road. I'm not, I'm not worried about it anymore. But initially, when you saw the chasm, they dug out of the, the side of the road. Mm -hmm. It was it was seemingly for sure. Oh yeah. It still is in a few, few spots, but I'm I'm pretty darn sure we double uh, two vehicles. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Yep. So I'm Michelle Packard. I just want to say that you know, when the ditching is done by the contractor, the town needs to maintain that ditching. I'm just stating it because I've been through more than one storm and the road's been put back together and there's been ditching, but the grader comes through and takes the ditch away. And every time they take the ditch away. So I just want to say how important it is that once the ditching's done, the town's going to maintain it and keep that ditching. Because actually, I'm sorry. But Macintosh Shield's better than mine though at the moment, but I know it's gonna get better. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no. It's okay, it's gonna get better. Uh, but because that's the way I avoid the traffic at the end of the road. That's just all I want to say on it because I think it's really, really important and I think you can't <coughs> not maintain it. Because contractor's gonna do all this work, it's gonna be ditched, it's gonna be beautiful, it's gonna work. But over the years, it goes away because the town's not maintaining it properly. Right. Thank you. That's all. Is there any other questions in regards to the, we'll just call it the flood time work? I actually do have a question. I live on that National Road. And while I'm concerned about the dishes, I'm also concerned about the culverts that are personally maintained by property owners along the road. <coughs> my neighbor has not done a thing for with his culverts in the 15 years that I lived there, and the town won't do anything about it either. And so therefore, all these lovely ditches do is they bring all the water to the bottom of that driveway, and then it goes across the road and washes the road into my pasture down the field. And I don't have any control over that. And the town won't do anything about it, and the property owner won't do anything about it. So what happens in a case like that? There has to be some responsibility for the culverts as well. And we've I don't been know what the answer is, I'm just yeah. putting it out there as well. And we've been talking about that in-house on, on us um, 
I'm sure it's something we can flush out. Yeah. We, we plan on working on a plan to flush culverts in the late spring, early summer. Um, and to do that, we'll probably end up needing a little bit of equipment that we don't have. That way we don't have to borrow from the fire department. Um, but it, it's something that we have been talking about to try and get out in front of that going forward. Because um, I have seen when I've been out there, there's, there's lots of dry culverts that are plugged and solid. Um, and then you can see the water goes over the top of it and down to the next person. So um, that, that's something definitely we can do better as a town is, is cleaning out culverts. So, and it's been identified. Is there any plan to do um, any paving of Gillian Park, the park that's paved? Um, I grew up in Vermont, and so I tell my husband that we're raised to try to figure out the way around the road to, you know, to avoid the holes. But there's some places that it's really hard to avoid the holes. And it, it seems like when they get filled, they get filled and there's this little bump, but then it, it, it like for some reason doesn't stick and immediately pops up out. So I don't know if it needs more gravel, if it needs to be humped up like two feet and then the people try to work. I don't know because that's not my bag, but I know that it doesn't seem like the whole road's been made for a long time. And it, I, I just, our, our vehicles like the Chris's are falling apart. It's like, yeah, it's, it's that. There was no, they didn't go out with any of the FEMA work. Yeah, that um, Lisa, but you know what, we can I put it on the list and, and certainly there's other products that could be used, hot patch or whatever, to figure it out. And, and so we'll talk to, to Alan, and, but I did put that on the list Thank with you. the other stuff, with Aaron's and um, a couple other people to, to make sure that they get looked at. So, yes. so I'm Margaret Penelope and my mother and father-in-law are Robert and Marilyn Wade, they live on Hooper Hollow Road, which is a very, very traffic mess yeah. And we're just wondering if a sign could be put up that it's not a through road. Um, because people keep taking Google Maps down and they walk down past the and spend the oh, night. Oh, really? Their yeah. Maps. <laughs> oh, no kidding. I didn't know twice. Wow. So yeah. If like, just a small sign could be put up. Sounds like there's an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. They're not really looking forward to having Yeah. Hollow not long ago, so yeah. I, I can't even believe somebody would. Yeah, so pastor houses are yeah. what used to be a class four. I know where it is. Wow. Yeah, I will put that on the list. Okay. Absolutely. So I'd like to wrap up the FEMA discussion, um, <laughs> but I appreciate all the feedback and, and you know, if. if if there are individual, which I'm sure there are lots of individual um, issues on on different roads, um, just but make sure that we get information into the town office so that yeah. we can um, put that on our list of to do. Um, yeah, just call and ask for me, and and I'll um, and we'll put you on the list and get it taken care. Of. And Aaron, you're on here, so you're good. You're on here, so okay. <laughs> Right. We will move ahead to our uh, next point, which is Alan. We, uh, we started the discussion a couple of meetings ago in regards to um, the potential purchase of some new equipment. Um, we've had the we've had the ongoing um, issues with the one ton truck, which has consumed a lot of res resources. Um, and you know we're at a, we talked at the last meeting on either you know what to do with that truck you know do we keep it do we trade it do we trade it what do we trade it for or do we do nothing so tonight's kind of the night we need to make a decision on it or something hell um, it was um, in our packets there were two options in regards to in regards to purchase, 
Trees um, also put in there what the equipment maintenance schedule would look like with that. Just trying to find where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. Oh, here's this. There's uh, the four, uh, four options. So there's the vehicles, and then there was the four options for finance. And Alan had given us a list that I had Kelly type up, and we put a numbers next to it. So I guess, Alan, could you just briefly, could you just recap the two options for the trade-in? Okay, hang on one second. Sorry. There's, there's more seats up front too. Now they've been vacated. So can you just back up, Alan, to what you started with? 
It also comes down to availability. Uh, we're going to start out the season not having a truck to do all camp work. Um, everything that the one ton's been asked to do for, I don't know how many years. Um, as it is right now, we have a craft frame on that truck. Um, it's been asked, that truck has been asked to do a lot of work. Um, it's just, uh, it's been overworked also at the same time. Okay, so hold on. I, I just want to, just want to put us right on the, I just want to find out what, we can talk about what we're going to use it for, or what happens if we can. So I'm just trying to figure out. If we keep that one ton, use it as our runner, then it's still. So the new one ton truck. Hold on, because when you were talking, Mo didn't get to hear half of what you were saying. So the new one ton truck, if we purchase the one ton truck, mm -hmm. that option, option one or whatever it was, that comes with a uh, wing. A wing. Standard body, basically set up the same as our one ton that exists right now. Wing and sander. Identical just of the year. Okay, so wing and sander. And then the option two is the CV series, the low profile, which is a step up. And what, what hardware does that come with? Comes with a wing, plow, and a two feet longer bed. Um, a heavier chassis, all the stats are in this back. Uh, just more capable of carrying more, more weight. Um, the frame is not a square tube frame where salt is just going to sit in there and rot it. It's actually a seat frame, seat gem. Um, when you look at the two back, that's it just it's just overall better. I mean, as far as you know, to maintain it, keep it clean. Um, so being that uh, on the on the one ton truck, being that so the one ton truck we currently have, we had that upfitted with plow wing exactly. standard, and we ended up having to get a broken frame out of that. Would it be wise, if we did go with another one ton, would it be wise to not go with a wing plow to that? Exactly. And that's what the recommendations are. I mean, but I'm hearing feedback so, these guys. So the, the uh, what it's being asked to do. And is that what's uh, specced in here, right? This is the that part of the ninety thousand. This is the Fairfield, yeah, and this is the dump. This is the um, plow, which says front plow hitch, and so this is um, so this doesn't even include a wing, right, Alan? The estimate that you got from Fairfield. Correct. For forty-four thousand. Yes, okay. So for the for the overall price on that that we were looking at. Is ninety-seven thousand one forty. They actually know quite better than why, but one thousand roughly. Well, they were charging a sales tax, which I took out. Gotcha. Ninety-seven one forty. Yes, that's what's in here. So that's a front mounted that's plow this. standard. Okay. And then and then the low profile truck. That has the chassis that's that's heavier to be able to that we couldn't put a wing on that without having any structural no, issues. No, it's fine and it's reinforced. But it comes with a wing. It does come with a wing as well. And what was the price on that one? That's the one ten six fifty. So I was trying to read them. Is it is it late? Is it is it this simple for my head? They're similar motors. But the one ton is just a, it's a bigger, like heavier duty truck, but the same motor to push it, basically. Right. So when so you're going up hill, okay. Truck. okay. It's but it's the same motor in a one ton in this, are very similar. So you're gonna drive. get the same, okay. And this is four wheel drive? Yes. This is the one ton? I'm sorry? Is the one ton? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, all right, thank you. Also, the other difference is the one that's the better of the two, the build date is actually, uh, we can have it by October 2nd to the 9th, which gets us into our winter of not having to use contractors for that out of the road. Is that fully equipped? You know, the body of the on it? Yeah. Is it? It's being built right now. There's two, um, not that color really matters, but we have a choice of green and one of the two trucks. And the one ton you said was a March. 
was it so, uh, so December? I mean, dead, like end of December. End of November, December. Okay. And at one time, uh, like I said before, there, uh, this guy that I'm dealing with uh, basically was going on uh, was it eight ways, uh, uh, fifteen thousand. Yep. Which I just to keep at his gas, not being on site to see the flood. Just from seeing the photos that I sent him, mm -hmm. he said that's probably what they would offer as far as trading as well. Was that figured into the price for that one? No, it's no. in it's been figured in your capital improvement sheet. You can see where at the top it says proceeds from sale of equipment, the oh, fifteen thousand. Yeah. Yeah. And the Ford, the one ton does have the six year seventy five thousand mile premium. Hundred dollar deductible care, so it does. He did get the extended warranty priced on that, which was good. Are we able to get trade in value for towards either one of them? We'll be traded the one that we have now, yeah, towards two fire mock for that five. Yeah, mm -hmm. for, for, only, for only the one time, so we can trade the one time for one <coughs> right now yeah. for the CV, you know. Okay. But that would be just an option to just kind of keep it, keep nursing it, and have our runner vehicle. I did not create an option in which you kept the one ton. So if you do, that's there's fifteen thousand in here that I have with proceeds of sale of equipment. But um, so just so you know, you can do that. Just keep in mind that number will add. There's fifteen thousand as a revenue in there that wouldn't be. So which is not a problem. I can change it later. Just want you to know. Based on the options that you're bringing forward now, what, what's your recommendation? Um, I ran them one time, two winters now of Camp Road. It's pretty hard on um, The low profile is kind of untried and untrue. It's uh, new. So I'm going by uh, manufacturers, you know, uh, words, uh, what it's capable of, and areas, the improvements that made to that to make that truck. It's kind of a, uh, made up of internationals, cab, uh, Allison transmission, Chevy, or GMC, um, Denali, you know, the called Duramax motor. Um, all the best of all the uh, truck companies have put their best into this truck. Um, but again, it's on an improvement other than stock bridge. I have a question about the route. I know there's a lot of concern about you plowing with one ton, Camp Brook, but don't, I looked at the route, so isn't it true that both Jason and AJ cross, so they can certainly, they could pick up some and it would probably add like what, maybe an hour to each of their routes or just one if they were to pick up Camp Brook or some of Camp Brook? And they do. Yeah. They, they okay. of course, if they're going to be going down to hit another part of the road, they need the plow down and be. Okay. But they're not on the other side of that, you know what right. I mean? It's from top to bottom to top. And, yeah. Yes, yeah. Also, uh, AJ and Jason carry sand, you know, carry salt. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Sure. You carry sand, not salt, sure. Only Doug and Alan carry salt. No, Morgan and Alan yes. are only ones who carry salt, right? Yeah, okay. It can, right? Yeah. yeah. And the international can carry both? Well, I mean, it's all the same system as Fintries because they adjust them to what the sled of the material. Oh, yeah, okay. But it's all both. With either of these, you still have all those changes that they use in, that's what right. they use in. Yes, uh, right. For example, um, with the common wooden tires, so you didn't have to end up purchasing other tires. We we have run chains. Yeah. Uh, get changed also. Yeah, 
you have chains for the one ton, so if they got a one ton, you'd already have the chains, and you could just move the radio. You can move a radio from any, from either, so the radio would come out of the one right. ton you're getting Speaking rid of. Speaking of radios, about to update those to a new uh, radio. We've already started doing transitions sometimes. Or Yeah, we might have to budget for that in the next exactly. round. Yeah, but so you can move the radio from yes. is going, so that's not going to be an additional expense. Just the installation. Could we sell our existing one the five fifty outright? I haven't looked. I have no, I mean, it's just possible we set it so. So hypothetically, what would happen? What would happen if we did nothing? And two weeks before the first snowstorm, the one ton breaks down. It's done. That ignition. We're not doing anything with it. How could you? How could you plow your current roots with the equipment that you have left? Extend this. I mean, look at the major storms we've had, and over time, every one of us can take our route out. That's how many hours of overtime we're going to be adding on those guys just to keep us going. So, and, and the only reason why I had this. No, I understand. I, I just had, I just had, I had a lot of comments. I can't fathom having guys mm -hmm. work that much more. Seeing it's a tire on some of those storms. And well, I just, it's the only reason why I say that again. It's, it's exploring all options. Yeah, yeah. And I've had lots of comments from individuals throughout the town that have been here for long time. I remember when they used to plow with less pieces of equipment and we haven't added any road. So um, I guess that's why I proposed that hypothetical of one ton goes down, it's December, you can't get another option, how do we plow those? You know? Would we subcontract out? That's what we've done since I've got here about Dylan McCullough. You can't plow with a 350. Sorry? He's got a 350 pickup, right? And he actually destroyed a lot of his blades in doing that contract. Yeah, the other thing is, so basically the biggest issue with the one ton is the fuel rail. <clears throat> and if it goes, it's about a $12,000 expense. So if they were to have, keep the one ton, it's possible that we could find a fuel rail or use one or get it ordered so that we have one. Is that something that could be installed in the shop? If we had one, is that something that, or would it have to be sent out? It would have to go, well, okay. All right. Doug, what's your thoughts? My thought is if the one time should go down, we have done it in the past. It's, it's time consuming, but it can be done. Each truck will change its own route, and then we have to back up Jason, and we have to control all of um, have a road area all in over there. Well, again, it can be done with this sort of thing one time. You also would have to do the North Road and Laws and Hill Road as well. That'd be all included in that area. Well, and you do that on Christian Hill and pick that up. And then Christian Hill, uh, I can do all of Christian Hill and come back and pick up some of the stuff down for through that. Pick up with Jason or AJ, find with where they are, and then I can meet up and do something that they haven't done. Again, it can be done, but it's time to see what process. What's your thoughts, Jason? Uh, if the one time goes down? Overall, let's say, let's say we... Overall, I, overall, I think, uh, either purchasing something or in the case, of, let's say we did nothing, could we make the existing equipment work? What's your thoughts on... I'd say if I had a bet, I would say do a $20,000 repair fund for the one ton and we run it with just a plow and no wing and see how that goes. If we're not gonna do the ten wheel of the street. That was the initial okay. voices but would, would would like a ten wheeler for instance if any of the trucks go down the ten wheeler could fill it up. We could haul our gravel quicker, we could haul our sand quicker, we could get our snow out of town quicker with three ten wheels. But if that's off the table, then I say we'll deal with what we have until the time to trade it. Right. 
So I've done my homework on this, and I've been around this town um, before framing breaks that the town of Stockbridge has. They're getting rid of theirs because they don't like it. So, being that you've done your homework, so if I put you into the conversation of either, you know, do we purchase something, do we keep the one ton, or if the one ton went down, can we plow with what we have? What's your thoughts on that? So the town doesn't have had a one ton very long, 15, 20 years, 20 years. So it was done for years without it. You just figure it out. Exactly. Like I said, they've already graded before. You know, it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, you can figure it out. Didn't we get that one time just to go down? That's from what I understand. Yeah, there you go. First one was the used one. Yeah, one, one, one. Was the used one for the town this year. Okay. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a plow person specialist. I don't know the roots and no. Ain't one of the roots, but I'm a numbers person, and I think the thing I just keep coming back to my head is like, how can we make, you know, can we make the system work the way it is without having to incur any more expense? Um, and you know, the the most vital piece of the equipment that we own, you know, is the grader and the two freight runners, which you know are are due or overdue. And the grader we pushed back last year. The also, let me catch up with the gray also can be used to uh, file it as well. Yeah, you can put tails on the gray and take it away. You should have the one way we, off the front. We used to have the file, the file is no good for what that happened. But if, if, the if, if, we, if we did some extra plowing with the grader, what does that do for years on its life? Is it, is it hard on it? The it'd, be a little, it'd, it'd be a little hard on it, but it won't be that hard because it's not really pulling up any dirt. It's not doing anything else but just putting it stuff. And that's the so it's not, it's not going to work as hard, but then it's still going to be up to Right. Because, I mean, we're, we're set to replace the grader next year. And granted, every time we push the grader back, it's, you know, there's an opportunity there for some sort of, you know, major mechanical breakdown. Um, or, you know, it's going to keep decreasing in value so that when we go to trade it in towards a new grader, it's, you know, that net difference is larger. Uh, and then we have the freight liners, which I don't, it, we haven't moved those back. No, right? I left them here. But, but, those, but those are all coming up, you know, year two, year three. So we got grader, freight liner, freight liner. And you should also, if you notice at the top where we've had this, annual the 66 108 I had to go to 110 right. for next year then 115 then 120 and that still left us in a deficit right. here which we'd be we could hold for a little bit to pay back mm -hmm. same thing it did the fire department but um, this is if we pay take ounce all of which needs to be done a whole twenty nine thousand two hundred dollars worth of equipment repairs that was putting that in here taking out the sales equipment and then putting in um, which 97 140 and this is just option one option two or three gives you the right in the uh 110 650 so um and this was here was us making a ninety thousand dollar payment on the loader and then um but if for some reason that you don't do anything then these numbers could change your down payment could be bigger so your payment less but i'm not saying that's the way to go i'm just saying that's because one of the other options yeah because one of the options we did talk about was, you know, if we kept everything alone, we didn't purchase anything, that we could spend a little extra money on doing some more preventative maintenance to the equipment that we do have, you know, investing some money into that rather than... Yeah, it's almost $30,000 right. worth of equipment repairs that need to happen. Um, so, and, and that's also budgeted for in here. So if we keep the ones on that we have now, what can we use it for during the winter? Anything at all? All of them? Spend them gravel or sand or sand salt or sand to sand? Salt, sand. Or you can put, can you put a different... Is broken though? No, he had it welded. Can oh, you put right. a, can you put a, a smaller or lighter, for, I'm not sure if that's the right word, a lighter plow on the front? 
So you could still plow with it, just you couldn't use your existing plow, even with the wing off. Is that too much for that? I don't remember what the welding guy said. I think it pulled the plow out of it right now, fine, without that wing. It's just too much stress on the wing. probably what they did. Yeah, it's just too much on that one corner of the plow. But we could still use that in a capacity, or, or use the one ton to aid the other trucks. Get your inspections and things like that? Is that I'm just thinking if we buy another one and the new thing on Camp Brook is going to beat it up. And it's a big chunk of money to spend on something that may not reach its shelf life okay. because of right, running it up and down Camp Brook. I don't want to keep two years or two years. I mean, you got to yeah, yeah. snap this or broken that. Or, you know. Couldn't we, uh, it, we we plan on cutting the shelf life a little bit. Could we take some of that money to put it into the equipment fund? I mean the uh, repair fund. Well, you could you could use. I have you have you know, a couple options. I budgeted for the repairs to come out of the capital equipment fund. If you don't want to do that, then we will just you would instruct Alan to get all basically thirty thousand dollars worth of the repairs done, not including the fuel line on the one ton, and he would just overspend his repair budget. And you have to balance it out, balance it out with the materials if that, depending on the winter. Something that just uh, just to see this a lot of concern me a little bit about the discussion of not doing anything is that where a lot of this discussion came from was the amount of additional overtime because of trucks being down and thus that much more time in doing the roads and, and also doing the repairs. And so even in the discussion put that back in the mix of uh, you know what what did it look like last year with time down because we had one truck that wasn't out plowing and additional time into repairing that truck. So not just the expense of the repairs but the time we lost and the additional overtime was spent because of that. I think it just has to be part of the discussion. Plus what's tough with winter is winter is never the same, you know. I mean the last two years we've had <coughs> three significant winters, you know. Last year we had a lot of big storms that you know, really put a beating on our equipment. Um, what what was the the one ton now cleared down the most last year, right? What what about the other pieces that we had? Did we have a lot of issues with downtime with the other pieces? No. Uh, we I mean we spent just normal break hands. Yeah. I mean, you, do you know off the top of your head how much money we invested in the one ton last year? I don't remember. It was large. It was, yeah. Was there time to turn around and it's got to be okay? Of course, you had to have a program or something. It's just, yeah, I don't get you in the house. I don't care. Basically, you could have six grand. I mean, you probably, and I bet you spent money. six grand or more than that. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. If you pulled up, oh, yeah. I, I can't remember. Right. Yeah. I would have had to look. I mean, the only thing that we just see in our spreadsheet here that is if we did buy something. We did buy something. Then, even after, you know, we would have to increase our our equipment fund, even if we could and we would still be in a negative. Yeah, you'd be in less if so you I mean, didn't put the repairs in here. I mean, unless we, unless we, well, if we, unless we made cuts elsewhere in the budget somewhere, you would be adding, um, you know, basically like. Three cents of tax rate just to purchase that piece of equipment based on our schedule of, and that would be to keep the grader on schedule, the freight liners on schedule. Mm -hmm. And you still you know. get the whole about sixteen. That's if you took the fifteen in, bought this, and then you <coughs> paid for the repairs out of the, right. his regular budget. These repairs that you're speaking of, um, which repairs uh, that need to be done? It says um, the loader um, has about $8,500 seat and air radiator turn signal, windshield rim. The back hose says pad for outrigger. Um, the freight liner needs tires, rim, quick connects, a new plow. 13, that's 13 one, 13 two, tires, rim, mud flap, quick connects, and a new plow. Even tires are erased off all the trucks. I just have those. Okay. And then, so the international mirror and a bracket, um, all trucks need a quick coupler. 
So if you, the prices that we had for all that was twenty nine thousand two hundred. So if tires are out, that would probably would drop the price on. But about seven thousand dollars out for tires, so that would drop it to about twenty two thousand two hundred. So I guess the way we looked at it, Doug, was if we didn't invest in a new piece of equipment, could we take some money and invest it in some of the current pieces we have to maybe prolong? Well, you prolong the loader mostly, but if it's got a radiator leaking, we have to replace the radiator. The mold is solid in that, so yep. that's, that's what we looked at. Yeah, so that's in here. Do the most expensive thing for that would be to get that, that done. It's got, some, it's got a mirror, windshield, um, seat, all this other stuff that's, you know, maybe a mirror would help on the right hand side. Something like that, but you don't have to dump all that money at one time into that one vehicle. So that you can save something in that area. Right. Well, that's, that's but I would right. definitely say for a new something with the loader, radiator right for it. Hey, yeah, that's on the list. Yep, and both, we know Jason needs a plow, and we know right. the other truck right. needs a plow. So those are on here right. as well. Wouldn't that come from the insurance uh, on his plow? $3,000. And that's in the capital equipment fund. We were given three thousand eight hundred ninety-three dollars for that plow for because it, yeah, because it was you know used. So to obviously to replace it is, um, yeah. Well, that was some other stuff in there, but obviously okay. it's a lot more than that to replace it. But that's all we got for the insurance payout. Then, AJ's truck eventually is going to need the power too. My my yep. truck is holding up pretty good. This is holding up right, but it's just going. Yeah, we that's what's have, in here. Oh, yeah, we did have a fear, but that was ran too long. Too. Was that should have been replaced, and then we would have had a fear. And we used that fear mostly when we were trying to go up on, oh, with not with the road. Right down from the shop, I can't think of that class three road that goes all the way back up past, past the shop here. First one on the right hand side. Woodland. Woodland Drive. And there's that pile there we used, we used to mm -hmm. put that pile with the grade in the wall. You, you can't set a truck up there when you don't want to fall down. Well, we're going to be here this weekend. And you got six feet of snow up there. And the only thing that pushes you through is going to be the grade that pushes you through. Yeah, we always did that anyway, didn't they? Yeah, we have always had that. So, some of these things here, of course, that I would definitely would. Uh, Prior on things and do a little bit and cut back on some of the Yeah, the list was um, the select board had asked Alan to list every single thing that he did. So that's why the list is big. Yeah, but Alan could prioritize, but he I, did what he asked. I turned my mirror in last year to be repaired. Yeah. That when, when that first happened, I, I reported the actual list in. I told him that was that Yeah. No, I was just well, saying. These, these, are, these are some, some things here that, that and, and now. Are you 13? What one are you? 13? I'm, I'm just the internet. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you don't have a I don't have one. Okay. So we'll add that to the list. I think it says it's on here. Yep, it's on here. International yeah. tire. It says mirror and bracket right here. Yeah, but the bracket, the, the mirror and bracket is just a small one, but the mirror itself, it runs a pretty cool on the other box on that. Yep. And just on the half the side, just one straight crack down, you can use that. Okay. But it's something you don't have to get in place. Like, not right off, no, no right off. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's why the list was so in depth, was because he was asked to list every single thing. So, um, but that's why it has that number on it. So, what's the board members think in regards to? Well, it looks like we go. 2023, we're going to start making a deficit on the Well, that's if we, that's with the, um, with a new purchase. Yeah, with a new purchase, yeah. And depending what, if you're like, if you're looking at option one, Mo, you yeah. can see I have the, I have the, um, hmm, expenses for the repairs and the 97000 Whereas if you look at option two, I just had the ninety-seven thousand. Right. Yeah. So you're right. It would buy. It means you wouldn't have to increase your annual appropriation from sixty-six to one ten to one fifteen to one twenty because you would obviously would have more money in the coffers and maybe um, uh, and who knows too. We might get a better interest rate on a loader or I mean on the greater. 
I said younger, not lower, I meant greater, sorry. So, because I can see what your concern would be is obviously if you have to jump from 66 to 110 to 115 to 120, it's, that's a big jump the first year for sure. How much is that on the tax rate? He said three cents, I yeah, think. Yeah, no, three cents. So, well, I mean, overall. Yeah. Over that span. Mm -hmm. Over probably a two year span, maybe you know, three cents. That's to keep everything on schedule. Right. Because right. I, I don't think at this point we can afford to purchase and push other pieces back, especially when the other pieces are, well, these I, I see them as more important equipment in the town. Mm -hmm. Greater and your two freight runners are your, you know, are key and loaders, right? I mean, those are the key pieces. Yeah, so, you know, I think the, the loader, I think the loader, for what we use the loader to do, and call on that time to use it as a record service, I think the loader is fine for it. Yeah. The motor solid, and that can trans the all the gears and stuff down to it, and uh, it's when I drive it today. It don't, don't have a lot of wine and stuff, so if you go too fast, it lets you know. And if you kick right down, you can't go any faster than 26 miles an hour. Stuff will go downhill, you don't want to do that going downhill. That's when you get into gear problem. Hey, Paul. <laughs> I'm leaning toes not doing anything at this point. I'm just trying to rework the routes and, and take, the, the, take some of the money and do the repairs that are needed to the other piece of equipment to get them up to stuff. And we know we're going to have over time. Mm -hmm. We've got overtime in the budget already, and, and maybe it's going to be some more overtime. But we don't know what kind of a winter it's going to be. It could be easy, it could be hard, but it's, you know, who knows? So we can't really. I just think that spending that kind of money and adding another three cents over the course of time is just not what the tax rate is going to want to see. Now, it, I'm saying if, if it doesn't work, we have a major breakdown, and then. We, we can always reconsider and, and go out and get a road group next year. Well, it doesn't sound like any of, any of these options are ideal. Mm -hmm. I think you know, doing nothing, it sounds like the, the one thing we've already identified isn't the solution to that need, but also the, the international is the best solution. Um, I'm just curious if, if we went with something like the international this year because it can come in in time, are there Something and then trade it in, you know, a couple of years down the road, something else, the value of that item is going to be considerably appreciated. Mm -hmm. You know, once, once it's had a winter or two on it, or once you drive it off the lot, you know, simply that, that action. Right. But may not be good. The other option is, I suppose, I mean, I'm not down about it, but I mean, other towns sell equipment. I mean, is it possible that? If you don't do anything right this minute, but you allow him to spend the twenty-nine thousand out of the capital equipment fund for the repairs, so that his budget doesn't take a hit in case he has overtime, is it possible that there is a, a ten-wheeler that he could purchase from another town that would be used? But if they had all the maintenance records, maybe then he gets what a ten-wheeler that maybe you know doesn't go eight or nine years, and maybe it goes three or four. I, I don't know. I mean, I know other towns get rid of equipment all the time. We've all done it. You get rid of stuff. Um, so I, I, I just don't know. But I, I do think that if you're going to have Alan do the repairs and you're not going to purchase a replacement vehicle, you should allow those repairs to come out of the capital equipment fund so that if he has <clears throat> overtime needs contract and services, his budget doesn't get wiped out. <clears throat> I mean, I got, I got to think that with the amount of money that we invested in equipment, the 
the downtime that we had, and we had the contracts and services last year. You know, even if we went with nothing this year and we invested, you know, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars into our existing pieces, that we come out ahead. You know, I, that's kind of the way. I, I mean, unless we run into this year, from, you know. So, so if we did nothing this year, are we are we then looking at doing? Greater the next greater year. and something else next year? Well, I mean, I think as of right now, we're talking about just moving forward with the greater next year. And, and I guess it depends on how, how the winter goes. If we choose to do nothing, and we're back here in the spring saying we really should have gotten that piece of equipment, then maybe we're, if, if we, at that time, if we did go that way, we'd be looking at very similar numbers to what you have now, you know. Or, or potentially. Or it could be larger, or it could be less. Yeah. 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 So. And I'm not opposed to using the grid. That's a great idea. But the problem is, I'm not spreading sand lines. So we're going to have to go up and do it twice. So, yeah, yeah. If you've got two guys, one doing the grid, or one with one ton, doing the same round. One to move it, and one to spread sand. We've got to drive because everybody's out on the ride right. swing, right. sand that line. Yeah. Normally, the path that we have done that, the grid has to run up, and once the grid got done with that, they're really neat. And if you're just going to be clearing the roads, not piling on the snow and stuff like that, because you're not going to put down sand or anything else while it's still snowing. You, you use that when it's complete. You right. use that yeah. to finish. Yeah. Then, yeah. where the grader can't do it, then one of the other trucks come behind and take it, take it place. Same thing they had done in the past. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So, yeah, it depends. And then yes. you just didn't use the grader as much faster. So, you're right. If you don't do anything, like when well, you could. We don't know what's going to happen for the spring, and um, you just don't know. But if Chris is right. At least if you, the, the money that you're going to invest in these other vehicles is not the one ton. So if you were to invest in these other vehicles, he's right. You know, Alan, you're just going to, they're going to be better shape when you go to trade them and that sort of thing too. So I think that Chris is right. There's no loss in putting the work into them. Um, I mean, we we came from, we just came out of one of the hardest winters that we've had in a decade um, on many levels. You know, it wasn't just snow, but I mean, the amount of money that we were shelling out for downtime, you know, it seemed like that one ton every time I talked to Greg, it was one ton in the shop. And the one ton may have went into the shop for a warranty issue, but by the time it was in the shop, they found four other things that was wrong with it that, that wasn't warranty that needed to be fixed. You know? time going back. And then you have lost time and you know, probably with all the lost time that we had, we could have, you know, I, I'm sure there was unproductive time when that vehicle was in the shop that we were obviously paying for somebody, but <coughs> that wasn't plowing or, you know. So probably back over the wind, so right. Right. So. I think I agree with Paul. Throw some money, not throw some money, but spend some money on upgrading what we've got, making sure that it's functional and look at the roofs. And keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> budget last year when Alan and um, and I and Greg met and Alan had put in some extra money um, for tires so it was in the general fund budget that was approved by the voters. 
trying to get more futuristic with our purchases. Mm -hmm. In the past, what was it, two years ago? Well, three was in here. Two years ago, remember we remember we had the emergency we had to purchase tires? Yeah, right right. Here? it was. I was here because it was right here. It yeah. Yeah, 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 two. yeah, we didn't even have it in the budget or anything. So yeah, we, was, we started to budget for these items. Yeah, it was almost it was six. Like yeah, yeah. almost nine. That was great. Over two years. So the tires and stuff is not coming out of that thirty thousand for no, no, no. 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 that'd be coming out of your entire budget. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because over two years it was almost nine grand out of their tires because the budget wasn't right, but we fixed that this year. Right. So we will. Um, I didn't see anything. Um, does anybody have um, further on the discussion? We appreciate all your hard work and um, don't see it as that we're trying to take a tool away from it. It's more just trying to do more with what we have. Um, you know, make the numbers work. So, does anybody have um, any objections if we moved Ellie in front of Keith Laramie? He's not here. Mm -hmm. Again. Okay. Sure, I apologize for it. You never know these meetings, you know. When I drop my kids off this evening at the Grand Club, as I said, it's, I don't think it'll be that long. So I don't know that this one's going to be one that goes really far. <laughs> so you just never know how long these meetings go. They go two hours, three hours, four hours. My phone has a So we just to, um, so we wanted to get circle um, the wagons with the recreation committee a little history on it. We had um, we've been talking about um, kind of the next step in the master plan, which has been the skate park, um, and and the rec committee has been in here you know, a couple of times here in the last year, giving us updates on where they're at. Um, the last update that we had was June, June, June July, um, where at that point, they, you know, the um, some of the funding that you were looking for didn't happen, but you were kind of modifying some of the... Right, so um, just so, because at the last, because yes, we came in May and we came in July, and I don't feel that all the select people were here then, and there are other people that weren't here. I'd like to, um, and the, I met with um, Therese on the 29th of July, and because of the questions and the things that she was um, concerned about and questioned them, I thought that I would just um, go back and reiterate some, because it's sometimes you forget, or sometimes the information's not all there. So I'll start with um, that, you know, we did a survey in 2012, and from that survey that we did, it was an extensive survey, and I went door to door, um, three neighborhoods, and um, made sure that I got the responses so that, that it was a very complete survey that was done in August of 2012. Um, the tabulation from that, um, that we found that there were people that never used the pool or only used it when they were four years old and they wanted other things for the center. So that's our premise, our mission that we started out for is to make it an all-around recreation center. So then we got VIA and we met with them once a month to make up a master plan. And here's all the BIA stuff um, that we did to make sure that once a month and in compliance that we were able to do that. So then in March of 2013, we came up with the, the master plan. It's right, right here, okay? Um, once we did that, the administration said that um, we um, wanted to go and collect money and the only way to finance this um, 
a major project was to go through FEMA alternate plans. So the administration was went to FEMA. This is the FEMA. You know, uh, they had to do it many, many times. This is the FEMA application that they redid and redid, and um, and um, this is that the purpose of the undertaking is to improve the condition of the center. The new design will include the following alterations. Remove the existing enclosed pool house and add 200 square feet to the changing room and add to the office space. Reconfigurate the existing tennis courts and parking area for additional parking spaces. Minor mod modifications for existing playground. Addition of a skate park. New access to trails. Um, and addition of a designated area that will be flooded in winter for a skateboard park. So those were all the things that were put into the FEMA application and was redone and redone. Now in um, um, the process and everything, at the um, VA meeting at April 24th, 2015, it was determined that, noted that the skate park is too large and will not meet the budget. Um, Lucian and Ellie um, um, noted a possible design of 65000 for the skate park, considering 40000 construction costs. We will research the skate park and design, and since then we've been cutting it down. What was the date on that, Ellie? April of 2015. Um, the minutes of the committee meeting of um, September 24, 2015. Um, the pool house renovations are a go and will start soon. Though originally the base of the skate park was to be done at the same time, it will not. So originally they were going to do the skate park and the pool house at the same time. To make sure the renovations of the pool house do not go over budget, there is built in a, cush, a, a, cu, a cushion of the funds gotten from FEMA. So then at the um, committee meeting of November 11, 2015, the committee is recommending to ask that the improvement fund be increased to thirty thousand. Um, uh, Rebecca Rebecca Force was at our meeting to help with fundraising ideas. The committee wants to be ready for the next stage of the master plan, which is the skateboard park. We discussed the Lebec grants to drainage on getting at least the concrete base of the skateboard park. So. That was still the VIA, the meetings that you're having with the Vermont no, Integrated Architecture Task Rec Committee. These are, these are, these right are committee. the Rec the, Committee. The Rec Committee. Okay. The Rec Committee of September 24th. Yep. The Rec, uh, the Rec Committee of November 11th. Mm -hmm. um, this is the Rec Committee of December. 8, 2015. Um, I just have to um, get myself. Um, okay. Did I do that one? Okay. Yeah, you did November. Okay, now I'm doing December. Okay, December. Uh, of 2015, um, the budget 
request. Ellie reported that she went to the November 20-something select board meeting. She asked that, because I can't read with the light, she asked that the improvement fund be increased to 30000 in the budget. The select board decided to leave the fund at 15000 and would see, see about putting the additional as a line item for the Bethel citizens to vote on. And, and that was done, line item, and, and you'll see in the town, town um, report that that was done at the, um, as a line item at the, at the 2016 um, town meeting. So then, um, um, and, um, all right, I was in the town of 2016, and so, um, and then, if you read the March of 2016, the voters approved the 20,000, um, and they approved it by a voice vote. Um, let's see, now the January um, 13, 2015 committee meeting, um, um, let's see, where am I? Um, oh, okay, now that the pool house rena rena renovations have started, the committee is looking to get the skateboard park done. Corey reported that he looked into the requirements to apply to the Tony Hawk Foundation. So we, we started doing that. Um, the, um, and, and then it's also in here about the budget for 1617 request. Ellie presented a copy of the draft of the budget and she showed the committee the suggested request for the 30,000, how the 30,000 for the improvement fund would be presented for a vote. And then I just showed you in the town report. Okay, so that's that one, and then, what do I have here? Okay, then in February of two, 2015, um, the committee, um, um, okay, the committee, all right. The Lubeck Award was finalized, approved by the select board, and sent to out in the week. And that Lebec grant was asked, we asked to do that so we could have it for the skateboard park. Did they get awarded to you or not? Yes, yeah. Yeah, a thousand dollars. Okay, so then, um, let's see. So then, um, that fall, this is, this is in February of 2016, and I just showed you the town report of 2000 where we, we vote, the, the people vote. Okay, so then in the fall of 2016, Corey and I met with Michael Parker, okay? And um, Corey came to the select board meeting a few times about his proposal. So showing this proposal so that he could go forth to do the Tommy Hawk grant. Which we got five thousand for in in the end run. Okay, in this um, contract, with we didn't we didn't, but we used it to get the Tommy Hawk rent, and we put it on the back burner of whether we would bid it out to him or not. But in his proposal, he has stated what he would do and how he would build it, and. There's no anything about a civil engineer. And the timeline on this was that, that in December of 2016, he would meet with the select board, which he did. In January 2017, 
he would submit the grant application to the Tommy Hawk Foundation, which he did. And then he had to do it again, and we got the $5,000. In um, March of 2017, we would make a request for $40,000 for the construction of the skateboard park, which we did, but according to this, it was $30,000 as a line item, and then $10,000 in the improvement fund. So if you look in the town report. Okay, in June of 2017, they, we did grant, we applied again for the town of Hawk. Okay, um, in August, this is just a proposed sign In August of 2017, the pool closes, we hopefully begin construction. Um, and in November of 2017, the skateboard is complete. That's what we hoped and what we did by doing this proposal with uh, Michael Parker and getting a timeline and getting the Tommy Hook grant. Um, so anyway, and then what happened was um, October 12, 2015, um, um, Ellie reported that there was a good participation in the 50-50 raffle at the Ford Festival because I went around and asked to, and I had asked the select board if I could do that raffle at the Better Block uh, Ford Festival to raise money for the skateboard park and I was given permission and um, uh, all in all, um, we raised $136 was raised to go toward that end. Um, um, we have also, um, anyway, so that's what we did then. Okay, and then, um, and in the meantime, we got, like I said, we got the Live Back Grant for $1,000. We got the Tony Hawk for five thousand, and we got we did a fundraiser. We had a, a concert and a, um, a Vermont Symphony came, and we had a dinner concert. A lot of people supported it, um, as just as they did the fifty fifty raffle at the Better Block. They supported the skateboard park by buying tickets, and they supported the the dinner and we raised four thousand dollars for that okay and then um and then at the town meeting of 2016 is when we asked for a line item and got that money for the stable park um and then in october 11th of 2017 i'm not sure why we went in a different direction but um, Corey had gone to the select board to ask that Spawn Ranch would come and do a design workshop. And so that's what we did. Um, and since then, we have been um, fiddling with the design. I know it takes a long, it, it seems like it's taking a long, long time. Um, those kids that were here in the back that have left, they were a part of the kids that helped us and would come to recreation committee meetings. They came before the town meeting and spoke about how important it was for the skateboard park. So, um, what we want to do now is we want to move the swing set and we want to focus and we, we have someone working on the Turan Foundation for us to see a letter of intent and we got the approval of the DRB um, to, to, to make our master plan. So we are doing all those things to go forward to um, make this skateboard park. Could you go back to what was it you just said? A letter of intent to mm whom? -hmm. To the Turan Foundation. They, a uh, few years ago, um, gave um, 70 to Liberty Park for a skateboard shop. 
So um, I have um, Rebecca Stone working on the letter of intent and to try to get that. We did, um, like I said, we did get the land and water conservation fund, but they say we can reapply next year. So the Turin Foundation is not a grant. You wouldn't have to have matching funds. We, uh, I think we do. Okay, so so we would go for because we have fifty thousand in there, so we would go for fifty thousand. All right. So if, if you haven't already, and maybe you have done this, and I just wasn't present. If you haven't, okay. there is a grant policy, so you have to get permission from the select board before you apply. So right. Maybe you've already done that. So I don't no, know. we haven't done that. Because, I didn't know because we because we, as we went before the, the select board to ask for the Lebec one, and they gave us permission. So we just we just um, and. We went before the board and, and worked with Greg to do the land and water. Yeah, that one I knew you did yeah. because I was here. And that. we did the Lebec run by going to the sled board. Yep, so, exactly. So we're just in the trying to think of it, you know, but we have. Yeah, no, that was, I just was trying to make sure I hadn't missed yeah. it, Ellie. That's right. I was trying to make sure you right. guys adhere to all so, the anyway. policies. So, and I have the committee here. So, what else? So I guess. <clears throat> You know, um, some of the concerns that I have anyways is, and just kind of looking back through the jots and stuff down on the timeline. So, yeah. you know, the master plan came together in 2013. Yeah. Um, and then April of 2015 is where kind of the motion was, you put in motion the skateboard part. You know, that was kind of the beginning right. of the timeline of that. It right. kind of went to the select board. Right. It was, was given approval to move forward. Right. And that was in April of 2015. And the reason for that was because it took so many tries um, for FEMA to um, okay for the pool house. It took, they had to reapply and reapply. And then we had, you know, originally the, the goal was to have this part completed by November 2017. Right. And then, you know, here we are, it's August 2019. Right. So, yeah, I so. guess, and I'm just looking at this as a, right. you know, I, I don't have a preference of what we put there. Um, I mean, maybe if you ask my daughters, they have some preferences, but um, I guess just kind of looking at it is, you know, we we started off really good. You know, we we um, we got everything um, that the pool needed, the the structure, you know, um, and this plan was flowing. And then it got to the next step, and it's just kind of stalled. Um, well, it stalled between 2012 when we started with the BIA mm -hmm. till the opening of the pool house in 2016. Right. That was a long time. That was four years. So, I mean, I, I realized that it looks like it's been stalling, but we have been really moving forward by trying to get grants and money and fundraising. We haven't been stalling because we know that we have to fundraise. And, and, you know, we know that it took four years to do the pool house. So we, we tried to get the skateboard park right away. But then we found that we needed time to do the fundraising necessary for it. Because in the, in the original DIA, they estimated that the skateboard park would be 35,000 and then we looked at it in 2015 and said no that's that you know and we also were told that it would be part of the full house construction thing so we had to look at it in a different way yes so for reference spawn ranch design that was going to come in clearly over 300k so so them working with a small town thinking that we were going to be able to swing that. Uh, I'm not sure where the disconnect happened, but small little bathtub, spawn ranch, miles and miles apart. And I'm trying to land somewhere in the middle. Where we're trying to land is very much funding dependent. If we can get matching funds, we might be able to knock out the two phases of our project at once. Uh, we, Michael Parker said he's probably available for us first thing in the spring. Uh, to do whatever funding provide, uh, funding allows. But he's booked right through October, and then the snow hits, and it might freeze, and you can't set things up, and it's likely to freeze. 
So that's that's one of our current delays. But I would say that securing proper funding for something that's not a bathtub, not a spawn ranch, somewhere in the middle, um, to have a little more time to lock in a grant before next spring, uh, sure would be helpful. But this is, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, since, you know, it's been, it was like early 2017 is when we started getting in this whole thing of, we got to get this grant, and if we don't get this grant, then we can't get going. And then we wait for the grant, we don't get it. And then we're going to get this grant, and we've well, been we, doing this we, for like three years now. Right, so. but when you said we didn't get it, then we reapplied, and then we got it. So yeah, sometimes that it's... That a drastically reduced rate. Well, right. I guess my comment, right. and I'm sure the board can... Yeah. They'll all uh, pitch in, but at what point does the Recreation Committee, not saying ditch the idea of the skateboard park, but keep working on it, you're, you're saying right now it's 100% it's on funding, right? So right. it's not dead, but you're waiting on your funding, but right. what about moving to some of the other phases on here of, you know, a basketball so court we, or a tennis court? And we are, but or, I'm messing with the electrical company because, and I've been um, messing with Dixie because we can't do the other parts when we don't know where the electrical lines are. And I'm dealing, and I'm working with Tim Mills because they're put, they want to put electric, electrical, underground electrical through the, through the wrecks up to the reservoir. So we are working on other things. And we were working on other things because we did the trails. So we have been working on other things as, and that's why when we went to the DRB that we did the new plan. Because we are trying to work on other things. As we're going forward with the skateboard park, we worked on trails. We got the first leg of the trail, and we still are working on the trails. And we are working with electric, electric companies so we can work uh, about the other structures. Because we don't want to do a structure where there are electrical lines in the ground. So with the, I'm not familiar with I'd have to go down and look again, but between the tennis courts and the basketball courts, what, what is preventing what is preventing you from moving forward with either one of those buildings? Electrical On and telephone, board. yes. Because I, I met with Jim Coffey. He feels that the uh, um, lines are right there where the basketball court wants to be. So I want to make, I'm do trying to doubly sure that we're not going to do any harm and structures before I have all the information. You know, thinking about moving the electric, right? I mean, that would probably and, be a, yeah. Yeah, it, it would. It yeah. doesn't. But I have. Uh, I feel that the committee should be working with Tim Mills and working with the electric companies and making sure because basically, um, I thought. We were working with everything when we did the pool house, but then I found that that some things weren't in place. You know, they we they kept saying no, 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 just concentrate on the pool house. They wouldn't let us concentrate on anything else in the master plan at that time. Is um, and I'm just throwing stuff out. Sure. I mean, being that the master plan was. Well, it was never voted in, but it was. It was, um, yes, it was brought before yeah. the select board and they chose the option. The select board did? Yes. Okay. We brought it before the select board and I don't know how the select I remember, board. I remember it was, once they voted on, but it was, it was set up at one of the town. March 2016. I know for a while that we, we took um, inquiries on, yes, you know, who liked like which option. Right, right. Okay. And then we went before the select board and they chose option C. But being that that was in 2013 and... It wasn't in 2013 that we did it. Okay. Was it in 16? Did you... No, did, I think maybe... Did they do that before the town meeting? Before it went to the... Oh, you said before you guys discussed it with the voters in March 2016? Did it go um, to vote? So the select board somewhere between 2014 and 2016 chose an option? Well, even, even if it did choose an option, yeah. I'm it just saying we're, we're five years down the road. Yeah, now. yeah. 
So, so a lot changed in five years. Right, and it changed, and then we were five so years down the road for the pool house. Because what I thought was interesting is yeah. at the beginning when you were talking right. about stuff is the initial survey that you guys did. Uh, yes. The initial survey when you said you went from door to door. Yeah. I thought it was an interesting comment is a lot of people had said that you know the pool really wasn't used; they didn't use it since they were four. Right. However. Right. You know, the pool is very well used now. You know, you know yes, I know. That's true. Over time, so, and that's true. You know, and, is it and, time to bring this and at the back time, to the voters to look at it again? And at um, time, uh, well, uh, you know, we had good voting. Voting. I mean, they. they I know that, but that was not. was. No, this was in 2017 that they voted 100 and some to. I yeah. understand that, but there was a lot of traction at that time. That person's not here anymore. That's true, but we have, we, have, you know? we have people here that, that... I know, but you're coming to us again, Ellie, and I'm not, I don't want to jump no. all over you, but... But, yes. This is but the third time now. 2017. We had it. We voted. had it. Well, hold on, Ellie. So, yeah, okay. before, we had a deal. Last fall, if you guys had in May to secure your funds to move forward with the skate park. Right? Yeah. And this was the second go around on securing these funds. But we lost them the first time. And now we said we need to have some sort of timetable um, to either kind of move forward with this thing or just put it on the shelf for a little bit. And and then you know May came and then there was an opportunity maybe in June, July, you went back in July, and now we're here in August and now all over again we're thinking about funding again. So I'm just you know, obviously we have more in your committee's budget than the fifty thousand that's set aside for the skate park. So right, right. Is is the committee thinking about plan B and C and moving forward with this? And while they wait for this funding, because it just it's groundhog day all over me here. So well, it's, you know, it's, not to as I said, we're but, doing the trails, we're doing trying to find electrical so we can go forward with um, basketball and, and tennis. Yes. One, one more article we had that adapted for was last summer, uh, all the pool traffic. Um, they didn't want all the green space yeah. disappearing for a tennis court and a skate park. Right. Even though that master plan had been in place for years. Right. So we had to do a complete reshuffling of any of the articles that we thought were part of this master plan. Um, complete redesign as far as where anything was going to go. Um, so that's an additional uh, time killer. Uh, now, so come, come next spring, if, if we don't have free funding in mid January, February, um, we'll either do one phase or no phase. I know, but so, like in our position here at the board, is, yeah. and nothing against the committee, because you guys are doing great. John, we you're, you're limited on time. who's on the committee, yeah. but this this is the same exact um, conclusion we, that we came right. upon year after year. Right, but when we redid it, we did not in the original master plan have a basketball court. The original master plan right. did not have a. But I can tell you if you if you go into town, I, right? I'll just, I'll and that's let you know. That's the majority of people right now want to see a basketball court well, and an ice skating rink. Right. I'm just saying. Right. And I know that. And that's why we redid it. Because of the concern about basketball and, uh, and, and, and skate, uh, ice skating. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to say that my um, thing is well, delaying that basketball court is I don't, even though people want a basketball court, people have basketball nine months of the year. So it's not going to hurt them to wait a little bit longer to get a basketball court. They have basketball nine months of the year. Okay? And, but, but not, and we changed the plan, and, that, and that's why we're having um, some time frame because. The time frame didn't work that we, like you said, that we um, agreed to was because we didn't know about the permit that had to be redo, and we didn't know we had to go before the DRB, and we nicely changed the plan. 
about any of the other board members? No, what do you think about? Well, look at this plan. They got the, the uh, tennis court right on the boundary line. I believe the IV calls for a 30 foot setback. They gave us a leeway. Okay. They are the ones that approved this plan. We said that, um, and they had people, uh, uh, property owners could come, and the Ketchums came, and we talked about the boundaries and the, the regulations, and they. Um, gave us um, that as long as we put the skateboard park um, a certain feet from the catchings, the catchings were fine with it and the other people, you know, whatever, and they gave us the approval. I'm, I'm talking about the tennis court you know. Yes, and that's the DRB said that was okay. What about you, Lindley? What do you think? I mean, I'm, personally, I'm still in support of the skateboard park. I mean, I, I can see the amount of work that you guys put in both planning, adjusting plans, fundraising, adjusting plans again. I mean, I, I think that it behooves us to support you in that because you put in this level of work. I don't think, like Chris was saying, I don't think that we can do that endlessly. And I think we're mm -hmm. starting to hit that point where some people are going to go in one direction and some people are going to go in another. Um, I, I think my, my main comment here would be that if, um, if we are going to push in the direction of letting the skate park go, I really think it needs to go to the voters. I think because the voters have appropriated money specifically for it, it should go back to that. Um, but I don't, I personally don't feel like I'm in a place where we need to scrap the whole thing. I think so much time and energy has been put into it, funds have been raised, and as, as Shane was saying, it may, the amount of funds available may dictate exactly how much or how little is done, and that may in turn only enough for a small portion is, is done, it may even make a decision that we don't go that direction, but sitting here in the end of summer to, to make a call that personally I feel is not not necessarily the board's call to make at this point isn't entirely fair to the level of work that's been put in. Um, and that well over a hundred engineering hours have gone in my name. Yeah. That's no Eight. small thing. I got six kids. They're all gonna be riding the seat on or more than a day. I mean, I don't think, I don't think anybody on this board, including myself anyways, I mean, we're just here. If the will of the people has spoken, right? However, right now we're at a, we've been spinning our wheels and every, it, it'd be different if you have all the funds and you're just saying, oh, you know, we're just having this design issue and it's, you know, if we think six months we'll have this design down, we'll be going. But everything's on a, an if, if we get the funding. No, it's not on an if anymore. No. Because Michael Parker will work with us with the 50000 He'll work with us with that. But have you seen the two pages? No, uh, but I've been on this board for the last five years, and I've, I've heard the same yeah. story. So he, he And we've been looking for funding every year, and right. then we say, but, if we don't get it, we're going to go ahead with a smaller plan. And right. then we don't get it, and then we don't go ahead with a smaller plan. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking for well, well. So I'm just we we just throwing it out. I haven't yes. heard that in 18 months. To me, that's new information. The small plan. No. We talked about that when you guys. No, no, before. no. We did. We did talk. We talked about May. Was so I guess. Yes. The smaller plan, and we've been working on. I mean, I think what the, the committee really needs to do is we need to sit down amongst yourselves and say, what is this hard date that we're either going to move forward or we're not, because it's. And, and I know you've come to the board with different yeah. proposals of it was May, and yeah. but like at what point do you do something different? I don't, I mean, I don't know, it's just, and, and it must be frustrating for you guys because you're putting oh, so much work is. into it is. nothing, it is. like there's nothing there yet, you know? Yeah. It is, it is frustrating. And I think Lindley hit it right on the head. I mean, we're, we're all here for, I mean, the, the board, of course, I think it was just Mo and I, but you know, the board, was strongly behind the record right. committee based yeah. on the voters' voices. We're just here for a little guidance saying that at what point do we switch and gears or And we or keep wanting to go deadline, forward you know? because it's not just a skateboard park. It's for bikers, it's for roller skaters. It's a, we're making it a very versatile um, park for a lot of different functions. And that's another reason why it's taking us right. to 
But um, but yes, I would want to, and uh, and and we did. I mean, we did talk about, and that's why we've been cutting it down, cutting it down. And what, do you, what do you think? Before? I mean, I mean, at this point, should there? I don't think that we can you know, dismiss the skateboard park because we didn't. We're just one of the many that voted for it by town meeting. Right. Oh yeah, we're just planning, so we just can't go that route. And I think to bring it up again at the next town meeting may end up with a different result and may cause complications. Who knows what will come out of that? Re and put it back up there again. If somebody wants to put in a petition, you know, before town meeting to have it brought up as a topic or something, well that's you can do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in the meantime, I think we do need to kind of settle in on something. Okay. You know, we don't we haven't got all the ducks in the middle by um pick a day in a town meeting or, or sometime between then and now. Uh, and it's hard to fight back on the the uh, feedback that we're getting on the street. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. things are changing. Oh yeah, I know. Keep them away. The kids are right. going away. Right. The high but school's still, not here anymore. Right. Uh, but we still have a core of people yeah. that are working on it, and we do have. And like I said, I have three kids here, but they they left. And and the day I um, met with Teresa at the pool, I talked to two mothers right there that day while I was waiting for Teresa. And they were like, yes, my kids need a skateboard park. So. And then I, I, again, I. And they were people that were used to it. And they, they wanted the, you know. So I was feeling out people at the pool. And I still got good response. <coughs> so, um, Shane, can you just reiterate, I feel like earlier you said, and I just want to make sure I heard you correctly, that Michael Parker, is on board and could start next spring. Yes. So is there a, a, a version of this in which if we have, maybe it's a contract or a preliminary contract with Michael Parker by the time meeting, that this is going to move forward in May, it becomes less of an issue. But if by the time meeting we don't, we bring it up in some way. way. Well, the thing is, the only, the plan itself was never voted on by the voters. What was voted on by the voters was the money. And right. so what I had explained was, you know, have the possibility, if that happened, what you could do to get the money back. The issue, when I spoke with Ellie um, at the end of July was that, and I had spoken to the board first before I spoke to Ellie, but what seemingly no one had told Ellie was that out of that budget for the $50,000 was she also had to engineer to deal with the water that was coming off the mountain. So where she wants to have her site, she has to have an civil engineer to deal with that. And she has to have anything engineered to go under, you know, whatever's happening under the skate park itself. So that area has to be engineered and that's the excavation. So Ellie didn't realize out of that 50,000 was engineering and excavation and mitigation. So that was something that, you know, but, we But we disagree on that. We don't see why we have to have an engine. We, uh, well, I remember, because we have to mitigate the water coming off the hill. I remember Parker's initial plan that came before the board. Okay. And we talked about drainage of that hill, and that was going to be included in Parker's plan. Okay. He came with A, B, and C, and they ranged from, I don't know, like 8,000 okay. to 120 or something. Yeah, and that's right. it, And we had asked about the drainage there, and it was supposedly covered. And I would assume that if Parker's doing it, then someone's doing so, the engineering. Right, right. There's a difference between a professional engineer stamp and a contractor that knows what he's doing to yeah. the scrutiny. There's right. a mile between those two. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, Absolutely. so we're falling under the contractor's best guesstimate. Yeah. We're not falling under professional engineer. That is, that is a wildly different cost. Um, and uh, boy, we can make a through, uh, a through drain field. So we won't even impact the water, um, the water path there. The big stone is going to be uh, at least 12 inches of, I think, three inch rock. Um, water will pour right through that. 
It will not affect our state farm, but it will be forest enough so that it can pass right through and not promote any worse condition than already existed prior to the state park's installation. And so, so, but that's a decision for the board to make whether or not you bypass engineering and go in, into that, go that way. I'm not saying that's a wrong way, Shane. I'm just saying that's the option for the yeah, select board to determine. Yeah, we have I, I'm not surprised. Yeah. I, I know. Yeah, I, I, don't I, know. I, I mean, never, obviously, if you're going to build something, it's got to be engineered. I mean, come yeah, from, I mean, well, who's going to engineer it? I mean, you know? so when we get the um, concrete proposal from Michael Parker, we can bring it to you, right? Absolutely, yeah, and, 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 and I'm not way, saying Sean, so she is totally, we, totally, is totally yes, right that can right. be dealt with there. Right, so that it seems like that's what we need to do, is get a, a concrete proposal from Michael with those issues um, resolved in them, right? Yes. Okay. This availability starts opening up in mid October. Yes. That's why so, I can't even get a right. call so, or so, so we we'll back from But the what, what they're saying is that we needed to get it in writing, all that. I have a question. Can we just assume that Michael Parker is that? I mean, my understanding is you have to have several different people come forward with bids and, and you choose that person based on the best bid. I mean, in my mind, I would really want someone who has experience building skate parks versus the lowest bid. But I just am really afraid that we are, that we aren't being told until just recently when Therese was like, okay, you gotta have an engineer, you gotta have, you know, this, these specs made, the costs have gotta come out of that 50,000. Can we just assume that we can go with Michael Parker or is that going to have something, you know, that we're going to be stopped by that because I, think I, I just want to make sure that that's not another hiccup. The other thing that I want to express um, is that I really would appreciate a, a walking out of this meeting tonight with a date. Like, if this is not, if we are not ready to move forward, by this date, then it's done because I think it's unfair that Shane's put hours and hours and hours into re-engineering. I think it's unfair for Ellie to be continually fighting and plugging and fighting and plugging. I think it's unfair to the taxpayers who have committed money. Um, I, I just would like to be able to say either this is a go or we're done because I know these three boys sitting here tonight they don't want a $20,000 skate park. They, they've said, if it's a $20,000 skate park, we don't want a skate park at all. It's either something that they can really enjoy doing and using, or it's nothing. Um, and, I, and I am speaking now, not as a committee member, so have that noted. Mm -hmm. I am speaking as a pool director that we are getting a lot of people, and I, and I think it ebbs and flows as people come to the facility and use the facility, that people's interests are going to change. Focus are going to change. Families move in, families move out. People that support have left. People that have new ideas have moved in. And I, and I know that as a pool director, I'm there every single day for eight weeks, and I've heard so many different people say, what else can we do? Is this a, you know, is the skate park a done deal? When, when our people director, and now I'm hearing all kinds of other people's opinions and other people's feelings, and I just think we either got to decide that we're going to move forward or we're going to decide that we're done. Right. Yeah. That's, that's my I mean, opinion. one thing I just want to clear up is, you know, this is not the select board's gig. I mean, this is, right. this is the right. rec committee's. Right. And the rec committee has been tasked with yeah. following out the master plan. Right. I mean, all we're here for is a little guidance along the way. Right. You know, you, you already got the approved funds that you're funds. supposed to use. Right. And, we and got the all we're doing is just checking in saying, what's going on? Yeah. Where are we at? Yeah. You know, we're, uh, you know, we're not going to tell you, you need to say by December 31st that it's a go or not. That's that's you guys. You guys got to right. figure this thing out. Like either
set a date and say, we're moving in a different direction because this whole thing is for the people, not for the select board to decide. Right. Right. I mean, other than we're just kind of saying, hey, you got funds here, there's no action going on, we're starting to get a little heat on our end from people saying, what's going on? Um, well, I, I don't think any of us here want to make a decision and tell you okay. what you're going to build there when. I'm not comfortable with dropping it um, unless the voters vote it out. You should speak to Dietrich's question is, yeah. the select, you, ha you can, if the select board will tell you right now, you can use just Michael Parker because in the, in the purchasing policy, the select board has the right to sole source something. So they could decide, they, they have the ability to tell you tonight that whether or not they want more than one estimate or you can sole source it with Michael Parker. And then you could also explain in that as far as, um, as Shane was saying, how you're going to deal with, you know, obviously it sounds like you got all under control, how you're going to deal with the water because, just because that was an issue. Right. So, um, but yeah, the board does have the right to tell you that, Dietrich, so that you wouldn't have to worry about putting out 18. Does anybody on the board have an issue with it being sole sourced? I mean, this is a design build, so it's kind of hard to have someone design it and then fit it out. So, um, so the board, the board is fine with going forward with sole sourcing it for a design build. Can we also agree that the contractor is capable of dealing with any drainage issues? Can we get a the contractor? Yes. Yeah. 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 Is there any hurdles the state would put in front of dealing with that drainage type issue? Is that considered, I consider the wetlands or any of that? No, I, don't, I, I have no idea. I, I have no idea if the rec park is, I don't think it's, no, it's, it can't be a wetland, no. No. No, no and, and he's right, I mean. Some kind of a, no, the state's not going to weigh into it because they've already gone through their zoning process. So if that was going to be a consideration, I think the zoning, if that had been, you know, some sort of, they would have dealt with it. And certainly a contractor that knows what they're doing can certainly mitigate the water with drainage and, and all the proper, you know, ways to deal with it so that it either comes naturally, goes through, or it's dealt up. Last thing we, we don't want and can't have is it coming off that and then us mitigating it onto somebody else's property. That's not mitigation, that's just pushing it off. So we'd have to deal with it on our end. But no, Paul, I can't think of anything that the state would and, and come at. coming in with warranties on, on his work and whatnot anyway, right? So would... Yeah, uh, I would think so. I think it's something he he built... all cracked up because it was a design problem. Yeah. He built the one in Lebanon. So, so, he did an excellent job on the parking lot. They have water issues. That's not there. That's not where the soil there beside the river. So if you haven't got the drinking problems, we've got. When is the rec committee's next meeting? September 4th. Seven? September 4th? Seven. September 4th. Yeah, what time? And our next 6 30. And we have a meeting on the 9th that following Monday. Why don't, why don't we put you, well, I don't know. This is what I'm thinking that we pass them with at their September 4th meeting of them setting their di deadline. But it sounds like maybe Michael Parker isn't available to meet that deadline. Until so October. They, they want a deadline. <laughs> I, I mean, set a deadline can, to move forward or not. Can, or, um, can we have until October to, do, to come back to you? I mean, uh, <laughs> As far as I'm, just, I mean, I think you can do just about anything. I mean, again, all we're doing is we're just okay. keepers of the making sure that you right. know how much money you have to spend. Really, that's right. and that you're you're going about the master plan. Other than that, this is your guys' deal. Okay. I mean, this is yeah. you know your deadline. The only thing you're gonna have to start doing is answering to the public when things are not being built or made or right. whatever. Okay. I mean, well, I I think we should keep pushing on and then. We can ask the voters at town meeting and tell them how, how far we've come and where we are and 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 get their get their um, get their feedback. Well, it'd be a non-binding resolution. The only thing they're going to vote up or down is money. Right. If you want a non-binding resolution, yeah. which is just their opinion on whether yeah. or not you continue, that's something else, and we'd have to craft it. But mm -hmm. if you want a self-imposed deadline, we could put you on the first meeting in November. And then you guys could come, and by then you would have spoken to Mr. Parker, and right. 
and um, you could have decided at that point he probably has an idea how much it's going to cost you, how big, all that. I'm assuming, but if that's what you, if that's what you're asking, they could put you on in beginning of November or later November, whatever you want. If that's when you, as a committee, are going to make a hard fast deadline that you want to come tell the board about, you can always let me know, and we could certainly do that if you'd like to. What's the board think? Jason, come back. Yes, Jason. I think that the uh, board not having a civil engineer designing anything for the public would be highly wrong. I think that a civil engineer ensures their work and oversees and sees where the water is flowing. I understand contractors deal with it every day, but we need somebody to say, okay, this failed, you, you designed it. The other thing that has not been mentioned tonight, and I know it's been mentioned at many a meeting, both select board, town meeting, and committee meetings, is the talk of an in-kind in town donation. Do any of you recall that? And Greg has said multiple times that the town would yep. truck, the town would donate up to a certain, I don't remember what the certain dollar amount is, but uh, that's, there's language somewhere in some. Right. It's, it's, I don't have it with me tonight, teacher, but there's there's a there's a sheet that's plain plain as day, right on it, and it says this is how much comes out of the fund. Right. This is how much in kind it is. Right. And this is, you know, at that time it said Tony Hawk 25 and this and that, yeah. but yeah. that's what we're sticking to. That's the piece okay. right there. Yeah. Well, so good. If, if, if yeah. town in kind was. 20 grand or yeah, something like that time, and that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what and, we're doing. And, and Michael Parker addressed that in his proposal. He, he yep. did the income right. too. Okay. I think if we come back the first meeting in November with a yay or nay, that may resolve your issue with the town meeting, whether or not you want to go back out again at town meeting. You may have those answers by now, by then. I think that's a good thing. We're going to be right in the budget. Right. Yeah, which is, so, which is good because uh, we want to know. I mean, I, I, but that's got to be the, that's mm -hmm. be the, the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. and, so and is, that a, is that an answer of, we got Mike Warren on board, he agreed to do this for this much money down here first? Or is that a, hey, we figured out um, when our last minute for the grant thing we're hoping for? We. What do you, you, you mention there? Right you have all the parameters that you need. Your parameters that you have is the the uh, revenue piece mm -hmm. that you have. Mm -hmm. This is how much you can spend. And then I think it was a year and a half ago we approved no more than 5,000 square feet, right? Those right. are your parameters. If you want to build it tomorrow, go for it, right? I mean, I don't think we're... We're, we're not the, you know, the ball and chain anchoring you down here. This is just the two parameters we set were, you know, here's, here's your budget and you can't go over this square footage, right? And everything else, I mean, if Parker wants to come in here next week and build it up, I mean, we're, we're behind you. So. We're, we're kind of mercy his schedule right now. Right. He's still in the very middle of the building. And then he'll come over here and be able to talk about with us all winter. Again, the only thing I, I'm just extremely worried about is that it's Groundhog Day all over again. And we've gone from Parker to, you know, the other one, back right. to Parker. And I don't, Who's and, to say that yeah. and, two and new people got, join the board and you decide to do something else, you know? Right. Well, and then here we are, well, new leader. So well, that, that's we, my only fear. We, um, we learned from our mistake about Spawn Ranch. So. I would just highly recommend that the committee keep working with the skateboard thing, but maybe start to resurrect some of these other pieces right. that go with the master plan. And as I said, I'm, well, I'm, right. I'm trying to get Dig safe to let me know where the lines are. Yeah, and Tim said he got your map today. Thank you. He's been yes. dealing with yes. obviously other issues, right. but um, but he did say to say thank you right. that he got it. So yeah, I finally talked to him. Yep, he did he, say that today. He, I had been trying to get he, a hold of him, and I he know. had a grandchild born. He and did. Say, thank you, Esther. So I talked to him today, and I, you know, yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming out, Elliot.
especially after we were an hour late on getting in, <laughs> and the rest of the board members. And, um, I mean, again, I, the, the board supports you guys, um, and we're behind you. We're just at this point just kind of being the big brother, like, hey, what's going on? You know, when are we going to see something? Yeah. Um, but you guys are the. Well, I, I hold appreciate all the power. that. You know, and I understand because as a person that does this, I understand that it's I'm not a skateboard person. I'd rather, You're not? No. I'd, I'd rather have tennis courts. Yeah. You know, I'd rather have tennis courts. I would have built tennis courts three years ago if I had my, my way. So, you know, whatever. So, all right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The other one we had, um, we had an appointment for Keith Laramie. He's a no-show for the second <laughs> time. We had um, addressed it last meeting, basically saying that we want to move forward that you'd have to come with a proposal. So I would right now just uh, accept this moving forward, moving on to that one. Um, BC letter of support ability. Yeah, sorry, I did not, I should have, um, I meant to do it, and I did not get a chance to put this sample text basically on our letterhead. So if the board's, um, obviously I'm assuming you're in support of this project, and um, if you're okay, then I can, uh, Kelly or I can put, Ke can I, yeah. Kelly and I can put this on letterhead, uh, Kelly or I tomorrow, and um, just have Chris sign it one time when he's swinging through. I just want to make sure you guys are all okay with that. You probably should because it's a letter of support, so yeah, I would say sure. Chris is just happy if he wants to I was, sign it. <laughs> I, was I was a little confused, but he's like, "What?" This, this right here is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a draft, but it's yep, what you want to go with. That's what they're yeah. saying. They yeah. said, yeah. here's the sample okay. text. Yeah. All right, this threw me off when it said the property owner is a draft. So. Yeah, no, it's just okay. a sample text. So. All right, so we had a motion second. All in favor? Aye. All right. And I'll stop by to sign that. Please. Yeah, whenever. Okay. I don't, don't do it. Don't plan a sign by tomorrow. Tax day is this week. Uh, but I'll get it done. DPE, here, Jacob. Yeah, so it was in your yes. pocket, pocket, packet, excuse me, it just said, uh, here's a request to stop water sewer services for this property, uninhabitable for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. um, it, so Tim Mills, did they did shut the water off, so I'm not sure if, you know, obviously we shut the water off, so I'm not, sh I'm assuming we're just going to move them to vacancy rate, mm -hmm. but I just want to make sure. Um, a, I want to let you know we did shut it off, and B, it is, but since the entire, for once, yeah. Yeah. No. So it's obviously multiple EU yep. building, right? Yeah. So yeah. we would be putting them on vacancy rate at six amount of yes. EUs, and then, yep. and then if you wanted to come before the board for the would be a yeah, right? Yeah, I think he's just waiting on. Um, and that stays consistent with what we've done in the past. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do, we, do you need a motion on that? No. No. Nope. Good. Okay. Uh, the credit card <coughs> policy. If you, we can certainly move that to the next time. I just gave it to you in a draft to read, just mm -hmm. because, okay. as I explained that. Um, when I got here, you had a debit card, and, um, and we, you just you can't have a debit card because it's it's not going through the proper policy process, so it can't shouldn't have one. So we want to get rid of it. Pam and I talked to someone, talked to uh, the bank about it. And obviously, just having a credit card has a thousand dollar, you know, month. And this is just a policy I had written before, um, but we can certainly push this to the next agenda since it's getting late. If you wish, um, I guess all I would say is. If you have questions or comments on the draft, if you don't want to do it tonight, you could just email them to me. I mean, I didn't see anything. Yeah. I, I think it's a great idea, and, and you should always have some sort of uh, emergency revenue source if you need something. Yeah, it's hard because not you know not everybody 
we, you know, we do try to set up as many accounts as we can, but sometimes mm -hmm. you just can't. So, and it, it, you know, uh, Dietri is one. You know, she uses it frequently because she's buying snacks, so she might take the, the card and go to BJ's or you know things like that. So it's um, that sort of thing. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Anybody want to make a motion to accept the, the credit card policy as written? So moved. <laughs> yes. Your own favorite? Who seconded that? Uh, oh, second. sorry. I didn't hear. It was Lindley and Mo. I'm sorry. Yeah, Lindley is switching. She's on her games tonight, Mo. She is. She's disappointed. Yeah. Oh, you taught her well, Mo. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. All right, you. then we had the select board meeting minutes of the 24th, which this is July 22nd. Yeah, it is the 22nd. The minute that she made, she wrote the wrong date. It's July 22nd, not 24th. So. Yeah, it was. Thunder. Sorry, we we'll fixed it. But the minute, the minutes are right. Yes. Okay. So I would entertain a motion to well, accept the meeting minutes of the 22nd as written. So Second. Oh, I thought mm -hmm. maybe Paul had changed it. All right. No, All right. No, All right. Aye. Go there. Sweet. Constable report. Everybody get to read that. Now you know who to call if you have any bat issues. Yeah. Well, we give a bat signal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Take care of the whole community. Mm -hmm. um, I continue to have, I continue to hear really good things about Oscar. And he's um, he's very approachable from what the business owners are saying. Not not like physical things, but like if they call him, he's he's there within a day to address their issue or sometimes that day. Um, so. And he, he's been working on some some of the higher level things yeah. in town that need to be done. He's, um, he's been doing some um, directed traffic enforcement, which is nice. Chris had him and sent him to Christian Hill, which was nice because Chris got taken out by three different people. So um, he has been doing some directed traffic patrol, which is really nice. And um, it's kind of nice to have it's kind of nice to have Oscar with you know he has more than just the constable level. Uh, clearance, so he's, he's able to do everything, which is nice. Yep. Uh, nice. Some of the stuff in here was an FYI, mm -hmm. um, but you do have, you got to decide about your delegate designation form. I guess you have a couple of days. I wasn't sure if one of you wanted to go to. Um, if one of you is going to town fair at Killington, then they usually, during part of town fair, they have the annual business meeting. If you want to send a delegate, um, you don't have to, just if someone wants to go. Everybody just want to think about that one and then the next meeting we can catch that one out. Okay, I'll save it. I mean, we get some time, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Just trying to keep your list of board items up to date, so I try to, if you see something, or I try to cross it off if we've done it. I think the rest is just some FYI. Got a letter back from Mr. Wright, yep. and um, that's it, so. Oh, and any questions on the financials, just let me know. No, it's I early. Have, honest, it. Well, it's early. early. It's, it's the first month. It's the first month. It's the first month. Yeah. So, anything else? Anybody um, wants to bring up? Just a nothing specific. Um, I attended the Vermont Council on Rural Development's Leadership Summit today um, as a representative of the town. Um, it, was, it was just it was a great event. They had almost 500 people registered. Really impressive to see the gathering of other local leaders and have discussions with them, and it was very inclusive in that it was just a really uh, open environment to have some great discussions. So, just wanted to kind of let, let the board know that I was there representing us of that. And I, I would say it was really successful. 
successful event that had the Governor actually came to vote at the end of the whole thing and sort of closed everything else. Was that the one we emailed about? That the, oh, great. I'm yeah, so glad we went. Yeah, because yeah. 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 you've gone last year, maybe? Yep. Oh, yeah. That's great. Um, and I would have um, I really, I've gone the last few years, they don't get it for two years, but um, it seems like they are sort of allowing a town, a town sponsor person to color the fees for that town person. And I would highly recommend others to put a few years if they do the same. Um, it's, it's really worthwhile. And I, it was actually hard to decide what sessions to go to. There that's so many. Great. Oh, that's a right. bet. This one was at PTC last year because I passed up them. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll probably move it around, but it's really. Um, and the Vermont Council on Health Development just does some really amazing things and is a huge advocate for rural communities such as ours staying, staying sustainable and being able to continue the lifestyle that people in Vermont want to see and listening to what that is. And uh, yeah, I just, I think it's a really great thing. I would say anybody who wants to go to the future really show. That's great. I'm glad that you were able to go. Yeah, unfortunately, the only session I had to do was not fruitful was the economic development one. Okay. Yeah. Well, we have some I have some ideas, and I don't know. Whenever the craziness ends, I definitely think we need to we need to put economic development on the agenda because I mean I have some ideas, you have ideas, and you know it's and, important. And I've been having ongoing conversations with a number of different entities. Yeah. It's, it's starting to come time to start pulling those together. That's and great. Cohesive conversation. That's it. It is. It's all about growing the brand list, which is what. Yeah. Our focus needs to be for sure. Yeah. And it has to be, I mean, in my, this is just my opinion, but it has to be driven by our community and what our community wants to see. Absolutely. A lot of people can come in and you can hire outside economic development consultants to come in and tell you what you should do, but they don't know. No. That whole way, that whole way, they don't know that. You're right. If they have any information there, I mean, because what I think of economic development in Bethel, we have. We have such a small footprint, but at the same time, you don't have an opportunity to expand that footprint. You know what I mean? So yeah, they talk about like, <laughs> towns like us that really struggle for that footprint. And there are a number of ways to that. Economic development. I mean, this wasn't an economic yeah. development summit, and I've, I've been to a number in the state um, now, and there are a number of ways to look at it. And there are certainly towns that have done this without having the ability to expand, and there are ways to expand without necessarily having to be centered on downtown. And, um, and to, in some ways, start with more of a support of a, a greater economy and how you do that from a citizen level of supporting a greater economy to ultimately build everyone up simultaneously. Uh, which, yeah. in turn, the yeah. goal of is building a brand list. And so it's, yeah. it's definitely something I've spent a lot of time yeah. researching and having those conversations of how do we get there. Um, and there, there are a hundred and there's different, yeah, there's different ways for what fits for you. And, and I did, on a side note, had a conversation um, for about an hour the other day with uh, Lang Gurphy, who stopped by the office and visited with him a little bit. And uh, that was interesting, too. And, um, you know, some interesting things about what they'd done before, like you and I had talked about with, you know, they, they did um, uh, the Bethel, you know, Business Association or BBA or whatever, I can remember that. And that was interesting too, you know. And there seems to be <clears throat> some interest in local, with local business owners about starting something like that again, and not just using, not just downtown businesses, but people who have businesses out on the outskirts or home businesses. And then I was actually um, a friend who's uh, a developer and, and, and did some great economic development things in another town. And I spoke to him. Actually, just got the word about this Northern Borders grant, which used to be. Specifically for towns bordering Canada, and now it's spread, and it's actually pretty interesting. And I keep thinking about, you know, is there is the, you know casting the building still utilized? Is there room, you know, there? So there is some some possible some money as well as CBE money for, like, say we had a maybe South Bain or somebody coming into town because of buildings that you can purchase and reestablish for low to moderate income is nice too by you know dealing with some issues and kind of making the town as you come in you know more attractive and of course housing is a big thing in Vermont right now not just low income but moderate for like what they call worker housing um, so I, I think economic development is interesting and, and certainly a way to do that and maybe even you know thinking along lines is getting a committee going for economic development making it of a mixed people and and certainly um, having the select board liaison 
to do something like that. But yeah, I think you know people have. It's amazing when you go these. I had the opportunity to go with Lindley and Lily last year, I think, in Killington. And some people really think outside of the box, and it's pretty interesting well, things they've done. And the reality is, our town is actually our town is used as an example significantly in the meetings yeah. as a place that is doing some creative economy endeavors and, and making some shifts in a really hard situation. And so, like today, I had a handful of people come up to me and say, "I just heard all about such and such stuff in Buffalo," and two or three other people who are not Buffalo residents were actually speaking about work they've done with the town or you know.